you guys ready? You yep. want us to uh, give five seconds heads up? Five, four, three. Okay, go ahead. Okay. All right, welcome everyone to the first city council meeting of the new term. We are today, Tuesday, November the 22nd, and we're about to go in camera. I want to start first by welcoming our new councillors to the very first meeting, and we'll do a little bit more of this as we go on. But our first order of business is to go in camera. So I'm looking for a motion from council to go in camera. I've got a motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. So we'll now call the vote. If you can show by hands, all in favor? Okay, we are unanimous. Uh, we are now gonna go in camera. And for those of you at home, when we're done inside of committee room one, having our in-camera meeting, which is with the cameras off, we're gonna then resume back here in council chambers to continue for the remainder of the meeting. So we'll all head in camera. Your leave your electronic devices here in council chambers. Our sergeant at arms representative will keep an eye on things.
All rise, please. All right, everybody, welcome to tonight's council uh, chamber for our first council meeting of the new term. Uh, we we're joined by some of our new counselors. We've got Councillor Ruth Ann Neustag, we've got Councillor Tony Baldinelli, and Councillor Mona Patel, our newest reps to council. I'll put a big hand for our new counselors. So ladies and gentlemen, as we start, uh, we just had an in-camera meeting in committee room one where the cameras are off and now we're back in open session. So the first item uh, of business is as we kick off our Tuesday, November 22nd regular meeting as we start off with the singing of O Canada. So singing O Canada tonight, allow me to introduce our singer. So Gia DeChico is our singer here today. Welcome, Gia, and I'll get you to come up to the microphone and make sure the little red light is on the little button. It, yeah, it's on, Bill? Okay, our clerk tells me it's on. That's great, thank you for that. So, and it's nice today. She's gonna be singing live in chambers where sometimes we have recorded ones and now it's so nice that we can have you here together. It's just an amazing feeling. So thank you for all of you for being here. Today's performance of our national anthem will be performed, as I mentioned, by Gia DeChico. She's a 12-year-old grade 7 student at John Henry Newman, used to be known as Cardinal Newman. She loves to sing and act and has performed in many Linus Hand production musicals, including The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and The Descendants. She'll be performing in the upcoming musical Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, debuting this December. She's also playing the lead role in her school's Christmas play this year, so good luck with that. Gia enjoys many extracurricular activities, including singing in the school band and is the Minister of Arts and Music on this year's Student Council. So very active. Good for you, Gia. So please welcome Gia DeChico, who's going to now sing the National Anthem. Oh, Canada, our home and native land. True patriot love in all of us command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, true north strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God keep our land glorious and free. O oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Awesome. So Gia, we're very proud of you. That was great, and it's not easy. I'll tell you something. People, you know, they often say they people would rather be in the casket than delivering the eulogy. That's one for <laughs> Councillor Newestag here today. And and to think it's easy to public speak, try public singing. And she did it bang on. Well done. You did us proud. Big hand. Great job. Gia. So if you would just remain standing, we are going to now do our land acknowledgement. If I can draw your attention to the screens and let me introduce our land acknowledgement. With the aim of educating our community, I'd like to invite Chief Stacy Laform, Chief of the Mississaugas of the Credit, to share his testimony as we acknowledge and thank the Indigenous peoples who are stewards of this land for a millennia before us. I meet Gima, Chief R. Stacy Laform, Mississaugas of the Credit. I'd like to acknowledge the Creator, the world around us, and our place within it. I acknowledge the many nations that walked this land in the past, the many nations that walk it today, and welcome you to the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe. The treaties with the Mississaugas are the Niagara Treaty of 1781, 
and the Between the Lakes Treaty of 1792. I would also like to acknowledge the Treaty of 1764 that recognized the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which set a new relationship between the Indigenous people and the Crown. Chimigwich Bumpi. Thank you, Chief Laforme, and we're grateful for the land we shared together. Please be seated. Now, first off, I know we acknowledged our new uh, councillors, our three new city councillors. I'd like to also acknowledge the return of all the rest of city council. Uh, I know everybody is glad that the campaign's over and you're not, you don't have to look at those ugly election signs anymore. So hopefully there's not going to be an election for a little while. What was that? A couple here. Oh, and thank you. I almost forgot. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for that. And I'd like to acknowledge we do have a couple of our successful regional councillors joining us here tonight. We've got newly elected, both newly elected. First, if you could just stand up and give a little wave. Uh, former city councillor, both of them, Joyce Morocco, first off. Joyce and Kim Crater, both of you. And also, um, we've got uh, one of our new general managers, uh, Shelly, is uh, just to the right of Joyce Morocco. Uh, she joins us. She was formerly uh, in Norfolk, and uh, we're thrilled to have her here. She's really uh, taken customer service to a new level at the city. Shelly, can you just be acknowledged? Stand up and be acknowledged for us all. So, <laughs> All right, so moving on, and I'm going to uh, follow through, and then we've got some people we need to acknowledge today, and we're going to do that in just a moment. So first up, uh, we're looking for adoption of the minutes from our September the 12th meeting. Motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. If there's no discussion to that, we'll call the vote. All those in favor, show of hands. Okay, and that's unanimously approved. Thank you for that. Next up are disclosures of a pecuniary interest. Do we have any councillors that have a pecuniary interest? And just before I have you come up, and that's uh, for anyone that may have a conflict, we have these pads inside the drawer, and if there's some reason that you want to acknowledge this public disclosure, you just have to jot it down, declare it, and then we hand it in to the city clerk uh, before you leave. So I've got Councillor Peter Angelo with the first declaration. Thanks, Your Worship. 8.9 MW 2022-54, road widening, along with 8.1 F 2022-51. It's our capital budget, but it's only that specific item that deals with the Montrose bigger Rexinger. It's part of a larger project with the region to widen the road. My family owns lands that are affected. And then these ones are all together, Your Worship. It's uh, 8.11 PD. PBD 2022-73, Bill 23, 11.3 NPCA comments in respect to Bill 23, 11.5 Niagara Region report regarding NPCA policy document, 11.7 St. Catherine's comments on Bill 23, 13.1 letter from Minister Clark regarding housing targets, and again, my family owns lands which can be affected. I'll give this to the clerk. All right, that was a mouthful. A Councillor Newest <coughs> You gotta push the little button. At the bottom. Learning. <laughs> That's all right. Um, the draft approval plan for condominium 5940 Carlton Avenue. I have property within that um, area, so we're inv invited to the public meeting. Thank you for that. Any other disclosure? Yes, Councillor Baldinelli. Uh, I have uh, 10.5 DB 2022-001 and PLC 2022-012. Uh, I'm their neighbor. Okay, thank you for that. So if there's no further disclosures, we'll continue on to everyone's favorite part of the meeting. This is the mayor's reports and announcements. So actually this is usually where council takes a bathroom break, uh, you know, but uh, you might indulge me tonight. So first of all, and I said this earlier, uh, welcome back to everyone from the election from, uh, from, we haven't met officially, our last council official council meeting was August. And tonight of course is the first new council meeting to deal with all the new business. I'd like to say farewell to Councillors Dabrowski, Iannone, and Cario, and welcome, of course, our new members, Councillors Baldinelli, Neustag, and Mona Patel. Congratulations to all, and you'll see there's a picture from the inaugural uh, that we had last week. So uh, it's good to have everybody together. First off, uh, starting off with obituaries, um, we'd like to offer our condolences on behalf of all of us to uh, regarding Dorothy Miller, the mother of Ray Miller, retired city employee. 
Katharina uh, Schutz, mother-in-law of Councillor Wayne Campbell. David Arsenault, employee in our Municipal Works Department. Harry Boudelier, retired platoon chief and father of retired fire chief, Jim Boudelier. Bruce Johnson, retired platoon chief with our fire services. Helen McCray Graham, mother of Chris McCray of our Municipal Works Department. Luigi Greco, father-in-law of Sam Vallejo, director of our Building and Enforcement Services. Dan Allward, retired volunteer firefighter and father of volunteer firefighters, Captain Brad Allward and Brandon Allward. Keith Simmons, formerly the general manager of Great Wolf Lodge and a great friend of our community who always participated in our Sleep Cheap fundraiser that, that we do every year that's going on right now. Um, and and I, I apologize, there's extra announcements because we haven't had an official meeting since the summer uh, because of the election. Uh, we've got some birthdays. We just have to acknowledge here our solicitor, uh, wearing purple tonight, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Needy uh, Punyarthi, our city solicitor, her birthday was September the 11th. Happy birthday, same uh, day as my oldest. Kira Dolch, uh, our, and, and wait, for Needy, can you just give a wave so we know who our solicitor is? There's our solicitor. Kira Dolch, our general manager of planning, her birthday was September the 17th. Kira, give a wave so everyone knows who Kira is. Uh, Shelly Darlington, our general manager of corporate services birthday was Friday, September the 23rd. Give a wave, no big one, we gotta see where you are, Shelly. City Council, well now you know the rest. Uh, Councilor Wayne Thompson, his birthday was September the 24th. We won't talk about what number that was. Dave Etherington, our director of information systems, it was September the 24th. And we don't do all the municipality, the ones that are involved in council meetings. Our CAO, Jason Burgess, his birthday was September the 25th. That's right, we didn't forget it. Kathy Moldenhauer, uh, she is our General Manager of Recreation, Culture and Facilities. It was September the 30th. Councillor Peter Angelo's birthday was October the 24th. He always tells me every year it's February the 30th, but I've, I wised up after a few years. There's no February the 30th. And uh, Sean Oatley of our uh, IS department, it was November the 14th. And where is Sean? He is in the back. Where'd he go? Is he here? He stepped, out. he stepped out, okay. I'd like to start off by thanking City Council for representing the city at different events. I can't always be at every event, and Council helps out. So I'd like to first start by thanking Councillor Strange for representing the city at the 13 for 13 Drum Presentation and Cultural Festival, Ivan's Bar, 20th anniversary, the flag raising for India's 60th year of independence, and the Grow Up conference at the convention center. Thank you, Councillor Strange. I'd like to thank Councillor Thompson for representing the city at the flag raising as well for India's 60th year of independence and the retirement celebration for Rita Puglia of our payroll department. I'd like to thank Councillor Peter Angelo for representing the city also at Ivan's 20th anniversary. Seems like that was a popular one I shouldn't have missed. Flag raising also for India's 60th year of independence and a taste of Cuba barbecue. I'd like to thank Councillor Lococo for representing the city at the AWA Niagara Falls Festival. I'd like to thank Councillor Campbell for representing the city at the Night of Art. And Councillor Neustag for representing the city for the Zonta Club 16 Days of Activism event. So thank you to all the council. Um, trail Loop closing event. The, there's a photo on your screens we'll draw your attention to. The city of Niagara Falls finally finished off the Millennium Trail. There's a picture of us, and that is at the last section, section six on McLeod Road that goes along the Hydro Canal. Finally, after more than 20 years, we've completed eight kilometers of trail, continuous system, and I was joined by Councillor Strange, Councillor Dabrowski, Councillor Lococo, Councillor Campbell, Peter Angelo, Thompson, I think uh, Councillor Patel was there too that day for the, uh, as well, and um, did I miss any? Any other ones? No? Okay. Let me know if I miss it. I, I want to know. Uh, also, Steve Ludzik, a good friend of this city, we, had, we named the press box after him. And here's a picture of the unveiling, which took place on October 7th. Former Chicago Blackhawk TV analyst and head of Steve Ludzik Foundation in support of Parkinson's awareness. I was joined by Councilors Dabrowski, <coughs> Thompson, Peter Angelo, and Strange. That was a great night. And also, Steve was recently given the Meritorious Award. I was given the honor of uh, putting the, the pin on him. Meritorious, I figured it's because Mer, Meritorious. Anyway, that's okay, we'll save that one. 
Governor General Award of Canada for citizenship, professionalism in his field, and commitment to his community. And I was joined by Councillors Neustag and Patel. So thank you uh, for all of you joining me. Uh, as well, we had a real exciting night at Club Italia. We had the Easter Seals Dancing with the Stars event, October 14th. There is Mr. Tight Pants himself, <laughs> Councillor Strange. Yeah, along with Susie and his dance partner. And together, by showing their moves on the dance floor, and let me tell you, it was a night to remember. I don't... <laughs> our, uh, our CAO said he had to wash his eyes several times to get the visions out of his eyes of those tight pants of Councillor Strange. That event helped raise $80,000 for Easter Seals. And in that picture, you can see, as I mentioned, Susie Mowers, uh, um, Councillor Strange's partner, his life partner, and his dance partner also in the white pants. We were joined that night by Councillor Lococo and Councillor Peter Angelo. Um, I don't know if, I hope I got everybody, and if I didn't, you have to let me know. Also, we had a community bench dedication and tree planting in memoriam, and you can see the picture, that's in Chippewa on the Crick and uh, Lions Creek Road. Um, Jalon Craig, unfortunately, drowned uh, right near that section, and we had that bench and a sign there for him. His family started the Jalon Craig Foundation, and I was joined by Councillors Lococo, Peter Angelo, and Thompson. So we want to thank all of you for joining us on that special day so that the loss of Jalon Craig won't be, uh, well, there'll be a lesson that comes away from it, you know, about the, having respect for the waters there. Also, uh, Ian Greaves was a former member of our Accessibility Advisory Committee, and we had a tree planting for Ian, and I was joined that day by, by Councillors Lococo, Thompson, and Peter Angelo. So thank you for all of you for being there. As well, huge announcement, a university is going to be in Niagara Falls, the University of Niagara Falls. Very, very exciting day for the city. You can see the photo there as we're throwing our graduation caps in the air, and um, except for Councillor Thompson. He decided to keep his on. He liked it. He was worried it might mess his hair, so he just left it on. We were joined by Provincial Minister Jin Jill Dunlop, Ontario Minister of Colleges and Universities, this is Global University Systems. We're joined by Cindy McLeod and Sheldon Levy. Uh, very, very exciting. This will change the face of Niagara Falls and specifically the downtown. The first cohort arrives here in just over a year in the beginning of 2024. They're gonna start by being in the Hatch Building next door to City Hall. They will be building facilities and when they're up and running at full steam, there'll be 10 to 15,000 students and faculty studying from around the world in our downtown. And just to put it into perspective, Gus University, they're one of the biggest international universities in the world. They've got uh, several medical schools in the Caribbean. They've got one of the oldest law schools in London, England. They've got an engineering school in India. They've got around 100,000 students globally, and that's who's gonna be located here in Niagara Falls downtown. And I was joined by Councillors Campbell, Cario, Dabrowski, Peter Angelo, Thompson, Strange, and I know uh, Councillor uh, uh, Neustag was there as well. And uh, yes, and Councillor Patel. So it's hard to remember, it's been a long time. So thank you to all of you for being there. Very exciting things to come in our downtown. <coughs> then we had Take Your Kids to Work Day and there's a picture on the screen. We had a bunch of uh, kids here coming to see what mom and dad do at work. And uh, we're joined by these grade nine students and their parents who work for the city of Niagara Falls. Are they all kids or? <laughs> yeah, no. There's a few jokes, but I'm gonna let that one slide. The Matthew, Matthew Daniele Memorial Fundraiser took place, and in case you're wondering why we're dressed in white, that was the theme of the night. It was a whites night. Try finding white pants in November. It's not an easy feat, but uh, we did. And uh, that is uh, Matthew's brother, uh, Chris, who works for the city on my right. And yes, he's wearing a white house coat and slippers. So we gave him the gears. They announced this year this would be the last year. They won't be doing this event any longer. They've raised more than $200,000 for local charities. So kudos to the Daniele family and all the people, all the city employees who support the, the Daniele cause and anyone that was affected by the loss of a child. Remember, we're almost done folks, last page. Remembrance Day observations, as you can see, the picture is from the Chippewa Arena. In addition to the Chippewa service, and we had a service at Christ Church. We also had our city, and there's the picture from Christ Church, 
And we also had a citywide service which was held at Fairview Cemetery. And we were joined by Councillors Thompson, Patel, Lococo, Strange, and Neustag. I hope I didn't forget anybody. So thank you to all of you that attended. It rained that day. It wasn't uh, the greatest of days, but definitely a lot better than anyone that was fighting in a trench through uh, one of the world wars. A volunteer recognition night took place on November the 7th. Here's uh, one of the pictures from volunteer recognition night. I was joined that night as we recognized all of our volunteers by Councillors Patel, Neustag, Peter Angelo, and Thompson. Thank you to all of you for being there that night. Did I miss anybody? No, I didn't miss it. Okay. Also, we just recently had the Santa Claus Parade on November the 12th. We had Santa Claus join us uh, by probably our best attended Santa Claus Parade ever. We estimated the numbers to be close to 10,000 people. Uh, and at the end of the parade, we had the lighting of the Christmas tree. There it is right in front of City Hall and the opening of the downtown Christmas market. And as well, that was the kickoff of the 40th Winter Festival of Lights. So the Christmas market is going to be going on downtown. It'll take place from now until Sunday, December the 18th. And for the parade and the opening of the, the tree in the Christmas market, I was joined that day by City Councilor Peter Angelo, Campbell, Lococo, and Strange. Thank you, everyone, for joining us that day. And we had a grand o Did I miss one? And Councilor, I'm sorry, Councilor Neustag and Councilor Patel. I'm sorry, yes, I don't know what happened here. Okay, my apologies. And also, we had a grand opening that day. That day, uh, we had the, um, or not that day, we had earlier, we had the Eastern Food Market grand opening. I was joined by Councillor Strange. The, um, let me see, I was, uh, Kaz oh yeah, and we also had the opening of Casimir. Uh, I was also joined by Councillor Peter Angelo, and if that one guy in the back corner looks like he's standing on a, a, a chair, he's not. He's actually that big. He's seven foot what was he, 7'6", Councillor Peter Angelo? 7 foot 6, uh, tallest man in Canada and the biggest hands in the world. He's a big guy. So they sell uniforms and whatnot. We also had the, the 60th anniversary of Dominion Auto Body. Uh, they've been here 60 years, and congratulations to them. The day of the parade, we had the grand opening of Antidote Apothecary. I was joined by Councillor Patel and Councillor Peter Angelo at their grand opening. And the last announcement... We had the 50th anniversary of Far East Chinese Restaurant. And if you have not had their orange beef and their dry garlic sparabs, go have them. I tr trust me, they're amazing. Our next city council meeting will be on Tuesday, December the 13th. And I thank all of you for hanging through for those long announcements. Now, this is the section six of our agenda where we have deputations and we have presentations. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to acknowledge some young athletes who are here today. So I'm going to work my way onto the floor, center stage here in front of these big poinsettias. I think that's the official way to say it. Is that right, Mr. Uh, CAO? Is it <laughs> yeah, but you're always good with that kind of information. So first group here I'd like to invite is the coaches. For our GNBA Niagara Falls Falcons 14U, can I get the coaches to come up here and join me, please? Do we have the coaches here? Don't be shy, coaches. Coaches are John. What's that? Yeah, oh, there, there's a doorway there. Or you can do the scissor kick and give it a shot over here. I'm afraid we're going to have to call uh, paramedics if you try doing that one. So I've got John N.N., James Babin, and Joe Cavelli. Come on up here, John. Did I get that right? John. Did I hear it right? Okay, good. <laughs> oh, good to see you. Good. Welcome up, boys. So let me just start by reading, and we've got these uh, little words for each of the players and the coaches. So first, uh, moms and dads and grandparents and anybody that's here to support the little guys that did really, really well, I'd like to first by, uh, start by acknowledging the coaches because these guys are volunteers. They give up their valuable time. Sometimes it's a, a thankless job being a coach. I know I've been there, done it. And how come my little son's not getting more playing time? And whatever the case is. But they're here not just to play ball, but th this is development of character. This is a chance where they can teach these kids life skills. Because one day they're going to be running the city. One day they're going to be doing all sorts of professional jobs. 
And it's these guys that help guide them through and keep them busy and teach them life skills that they can take throughout life. So I'm excited that we're all here today. I know for this team it was a long road to the Ontario Championship. Ontario Championship. I'm going to ask the coaches if you'd please maybe uh, explain a little bit about what it was like. Give us your version of what happened and uh, maybe talk a little bit about the guys and then we'll call them up here one at a time. We'll give them the reward and then we'll do a group shot and do a picture. And moms and dads, if you want to get a picture of your child up here getting their work, just come right up here. Don't be shy, come right up to the wall, we'll take some pictures. That sound good? All right, coaches, so I don't know who wants to be the uh, spokesperson, but I'm gonna give the floor up to you guys. Um, yeah, it was a pleasure. I was coaching these guys the last uh, five years. I stepped down now, John's taking over the team. It was obviously, this. it goes out saying it was a rough two years in terms of not having uh, provincial championships in 2020 and 2021 due to COVID, uh, so to get back on the field to have a normal season with tournaments uh, in the city and throughout the province, uh, we had one tournament in the states as well. That in itself is just good to have that experience. Uh, we did very well, we won three tournaments, lost the one in the states, uh, but, but competed well. And we were primed to play in the LB Championship Tournament, uh, which was in Brantford this year. And we won our first game, lost the second game, and won five in a row, and the boys just played uh, sincerely, they played outstanding baseball, and it was a well-deserved accomplishment. And we ended up beating the host team, which was Brantford, so that was even that was even nicer as well because they they were a very good opponent, of course. So, yeah. And uh, anything else you guys want to add in? Just to acknowledge, we do have uh, a, a number of players that weren't able to make it tonight, uh, Mr. Mayor. So they're obviously in our thoughts and 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 in our hearts. Uh, we had some uh, great con contributors that are in here tonight for other commitments in sports. But we do have uh, six gentlemen that are going to join us. Great, excellent. We'll give them their awards so we can give them to them at a later time. Might sure. as well. Yeah. That's it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> strong silent type. Yeah, yeah. strong silent type. Just what they said. I also, I, I do want to thank as well the city of Niagara Falls. I know that uh, Mayor Dew that you have been a huge supporter of all sports, <coughs> but uh, baseball to a certain extent in particular, and, and hosting the Canada Games. We had baseball in our backyard. I know that was an accomplishment for the city. Mm -hmm. The revitalization of Oaks Park. So congrats to council. Uh, past council, especially in yourself, for making that possible for for the city and for the future of baseball. Because I, I think there's a lot of growth uh, that we can experience in the coming years. And as well, sorry about that, but uh, we have a gentleman in the audience as well that is very, very responsible for our organization, of course, uh, Mr. Scringy. And we have a lot of uh, volunteers that in the GNBA that make this possible. So thank you. We got you. some heavy hitters here. Uh, Joe Brown is here, Bob Heischer. We know that they could be recognized separately. So. Uh, it, it honestly takes a lot of effort to piece all this together, and we just happen to be the, you know, to be blessed to play, to coach a very talented group of kids who were hungry. Because we made the championship in 2019 last year, there was a true OBA, and we lost in the AA finals. So to come back literally three years later with some different guys in the team was, uh, it was uh, definitely sweet success for sure. How about a big hand for the champs? <laughs> I do want to echo the comment they made about hosting the Canada Summer Games at Oaks Park, you know, because a lot of the games went well in two, and I heard a lot of feedback that they would much rather play at Niagara Falls because our diamond's a lot nicer. And I got to give, give acknowledgement kudos to Eric Nickel, our general manager of Municipal Works, because he had a big task in front of him to make sure that we pulled that park off. And that is, Oaks Park is one of the nicest ballparks in all of Ontario. And it's core. People always comment on how beautiful that is. We're so lucky to have it. We so can vote for that. It's, mm -hmm. There's truth. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And I know I've, we've been around a few tournaments around the province. So please give a hand. Eric Nicklin. Thank you. Yeah, we don't rake in the field himself. <laughs> but we, you know, we put drainage, we put grass, like we do lights, like that play, like that, the, 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 the trees around the outside. Man, that park looks good. You guys got to be proud. You got to be so proud. So thank you to everybody involved. So what we'll do now, we're going to invite the players that are here. I'm going to give the list of the coaches, and I'm not that you need the list, but you, you know your players. <laughs> but what we'll do is, as we bring you up here, I'm going to present the uh, the little plaque. Don't get excited. They're not that nice. Okay, I'm sure your uh, your rings will be nicer, or whatever you guys are going to get. But uh, I'll present it. We can do a picture, and then come up here. All your coaches are going to congratulate you as well. And you can do it whatever you want. Tell us, we'll do it, and then we'll do a group shot, okay? So you guys read it off, and I'll get ready with the first picture. Uh, I'm, uh, Jim, I'm going to start with the, the names of players who uh, aren't here again for commitments. One's in Texas for American Thanksgiving, so 
uh, once it got Marshall Annan, that's John Sons and Marshall's not here, Patrick Babin, Noah Etherington, Lucas Goodman, and uh, Simon Shera and Jordan Wright. So those uh, six players unfortunately aren't able to be here. So now we'll go with the five players and we'll definitely we'll see that they get those sure. uh, plaques. Uh, so the first player who is here, uh, Anthony Cabelli. Sterling Copajan. So these are for you guys, three coaches as well. Absolutely, we'll take some of these home. Yeah, oh, you can take Thank them home. We do group picture first. All right. Thanks, so gentlemen. So let's kind of gather and we'll do, uh, let's Absolutely. do a picture. I don't know how we're going to do this sure. here. Okay. You want to have a couple in front? Like yeah, 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 that's a good idea. You take a knee, guys? Get the goal. No, one more, one more. Yeah. There we go. We'll get this figured out. Athletes. 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 Hey, oh, hold on, guys. Don't go anywhere. Coach wants to say something. No, I says, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Street, right? Back uh, when I taught him how to throw a curveball. <laughs> you hired a, 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 a hired peanut gallery? What's going on? So anyway, we used to play ball together, we did everything together, and then we went through the GNBA together, and you know, we umped and coached and did lots of things, and then I went on and did other things, but Bob stuck around. And Bob committed. He committed 25 years of his life to the executive. And I'm gonna also in a minute I'm gonna call Vito Scaringi in a second. But I just want to do a little acknowledgement. So 
Bob's recently, you know, he's taken a step back from things and he's busy, he's got a lot going on. But I wanted to acknowledge this. And this is what this is all about, catching people doing things right. And I know Bob doesn't want this, and I know he's not comfortable with it. But the reason we do it is because we like to encourage other people to get engaged in the community. And we always say it's not us and them, it's just us. And it's all about taking care, and what do they say? Brush the teeth you want to keep. So we need good volunteers like Bob that give I can't guess how many hours he put into this community. I can't guess how many lives he's affected, how many people he's helped develop, whether that's through coaching or whether that's through management through the executive, whether it's fighting for the GNBA to get things. It's guys like Bob that fought to make the parks look the way they do. And so that you can get all the extra training opportunities and go into all the tournaments and the OBAs. It's guys like Bob, and it's the whole team. I know that, but Bob today is the guy we're acknowledging. So um, it's a thrill, I can read, it's a pleasure to recognize the work of Bob Peicher, not just my good buddy since we were, we were little kids, but still my friend. He's remained on the executive long after his kids were done playing ball. He was that committed. And people like Bob are hard to find. You know, he gave back because of his love of the game and for the love of the community and the love of the kids. And he offered years of experience running an organization, doing administration, and all the things that are fun and some things not so much fun. He took on lots of work. For example, like running meetings, organizing uniforms, dealing with rep teams. He did everything. The GNBA and the Falcons have come a long way in 25 years. The organization, they've got lots of good volunteers that work with Bob. And I know Bob stands on the shoulders of others who came before him. But today, it's, it's about Bob. So please put your hands together and help me acknowledge Bob Peicher. <laughs> something I can present to Bob in a minute, but I don't want to have to hold it the whole time, you know? But uh, and just before we call Vito, I'm going to ask Bob to say a few words, because you know, once Vito gets up here, I don't know, there'll be no time for any more words. <laughs> so on behalf of the city, Bob, we're really proud of you. I'd just like to maybe, Bob, you got a few words you maybe like to share with everybody. Sure. First of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge council. For those that uh, were re-elected and the new council that's on, congratulations and uh, good, good luck and success in uh, your term coming up. I know that through my experience, uh, uh, over the past 25 years, there's a few presentations uh, that had to be made, as Jimmy indicated, to try to get some um, park improvements and so forth. But we've always worked very well together as a team council and also with um, the city staff, parks and recreation. So thank you guys and good luck, okay? I really appreciate being here. As Jimmy said, uh, you know, I'm humbled by it. I never did any of this for uh, any kind of recognition, but um, it's very nice to be recognized. We're going to get this curveball story straight once and for all. <laughs> yeah, that's been 25 years I heard about this. <laughs> so the real story is, yeah, Jimmy wants to take me in the backyard. The old deal daddy backyard where Mrs. D would be in the kitchen looking over top of the back door, making sure what's going on. Well, back in those days, what, almost 50 some odd years ago or 40 and change, you know, was those days where uh, Mr. D just got the new metal shed that was back there, sitting in the one corner. And Jimmy's trying to teach me how to throw this curveball. Well, you know, I gotta try to catch, it's bouncing off, it's hitting that metal shed. Next one bouncing off, hitting that metal shed. And you know, you gotta hold like this, Bob. You know, you gotta snap, you gotta snap. Right? Okay, Jimmy, you gotta be try. Boom, once, twice, Mrs. D, she's hearing all this noise coming off the shed. Guys, keep it down. So a couple hours later, we kind of got it all figured out. Hey, you're doing good, you're doing good. Well, Mr. D comes home from work, right? What's he doing? Up the backyard, hey boys, what's going on? And he has a look at the shed and all these, you know, <laughs> nice ball marks on the ground and there's cheddar there. And guess what Jimmy says? Oh, Dad, it was Bobby. He saw the curveball. He saw the curveball. <laughs> so actually, there's actually no truth to that story. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy likes to, uh, you know, uh, promote the fact that he taught me how to throw that curveball and I'll be forever grateful. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, just a couple other quick things, you know. 25 years, it, it seems like yesterday, I remember um, standing at Oaks Park on Diamond 3 and Ron Butler, who was on the executive in the middle of that summer, asked me, kind of sucked me in, I guess, to, would you like to be on the executive and take on a position? Never would have thought 25 years later that, uh, you know, I'm standing here and, and I put the time and effort in. There's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, but there's a lot of good times. And the reason why I did it was so that we could keep the boys and girls in the community off the streets, give them something to do, keep them occupied two or three times a week, and let them understand what a team atmosphere was all about, what happens from um, 
coaching, working with other players that maybe they didn't go to school with. We always try to promote, you know, little Johnny want to play with little Jimmy. Well, we don't really want to see that happen. We want to see them spread out, make new friends, go to the ballpark, meet new people, try to keep them in the community, try to keep them loving the game so that as a registration, of course, kind of somewhat of a business, we'd like to see them come back for the following year. I couldn't have done what I did. You know, they always say that you're only as strong as your weakest link. Um, I was fortunate enough that my weakest link was I was very strong. And as a result, it was a very good tenure for me. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears, but I loved every single minute of it. Um, it wouldn't go without saying the support that I had, especially from the GMBA executive. Not only did the executive, we all came together all the time. We may not always agree, but we always managed to come together as a group. Made a lot of friends out of it, lifetime friends. When I'm back there, you know, I can't, I can't say enough. We always have lots of different conversations and, and work together. My family, my support, my mom and dad here, my sister, Jen, and friends and family um, that even came out today. A lot of this isn't even due with the sacrifice that happens at home. When dad was at the park when he was younger. And you know, dad's got to run to the park for here. Dad's coaching, dad's got to go there. And my daughter's here today and my son wasn't able to be here because of work. But they sacrificed an awful lot too while dad was out running around and doing his thing. And I'd like to say thank you to Ashley and unfortunately Gary for the sacrifices that you made and the times that I wasn't able to be there for you guys. Okay, so uh, congratulations to the OBA Championships. You know, what we think about that, we always work strive hard to uh, accomplish that and the activities that we can put together for you guys. I'd like to congratulate you guys on that. And again, thank you to Council for everything that you've done. So now I'd like to call up the, the legend, Vito Scaringi, uh, who he, he told me to say that. And uh, Vito one time used to work for the city, actually used to work in the Parks and Rec Department, but the door's right there, Vito. Yeah. No, come on right here. We got Mike Chaney here. We'll hear you. We'll hear you. Because we want you facing the audience. Oh, yeah, that's true. Makes sense. So I'll begin for Vito Scourge, the president of the Thank you. Anyway, I was going to talk a lot, but I don't know. You two guys stole the thunder here. Uh, there's not much to say. Uh, that was Bob, Bob, 20 years now, I guess, Bob. And the first thing you learn about Bob, he gets loud sometimes. <laughs> You know, he doesn't get his way, he yells a little bit, but it's all for the good. So I think the best thing I can say for Bud is he left a legacy for Niagara Falls minor in baseball. And uh, our baseball association is probably one of the best in Ontario. Absolutely. And I can say that. And we have all kinds of uh, championships. It seems like we have seen by guys back there. And congratulations, guys. And also, Bob, what I want to say to you is that um, you made a lot of friends over years, probably thousands of friends and maybe a few enemies, I think, too. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that I'm one of your best friends, hopefully. Absolutely. And thank you very much. Yes. And uh, Bob talked about keeping the kids out of trouble. And that's why I do it, too. That's so, the most important thing is keep kids out of trouble and we keep one kid out of jail. That's priceless. Thanks again and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the city, we've got a, a certificate that we're going to give to Bob and a, and a beautiful framed picture of the falls. And this will be a way to just remind Bob of all of his years of commitment and to let him know your city's proud of you and we're grateful that you do what you do. Big hand, everybody, for Bob. <laughs> This is your chance, folks. <laughs> because we locked the doors and it's another four hours. Ain't it?
Who's that? Those couple subscribers. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks for the peanut gallery over there. That's great. I'm going to hire the kids. We're at a council meeting. I like that kid. He laughed every he time. I could use He's the. At you though, I guess. <laughs> okay, uh, remaining ladies and gentlemen, I now ask our city clerk to please introduce the next item on the agenda. A public meeting is now being convened to consider city initiated amendments to the city's official plan. Public notice was given on October 26, 2022. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the official plan amendment or would like to preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting or by signing the sign-in sheets located outside the council chamber. All right, thank you very much. I'd now like to ask our Director of Planning, uh, Mr. Andrew Bryce, to please explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed amendment. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, um, members of council and members of the public. The city is considering uh, general amendments to part four administration and implementation of the official plan. Just be a second. Um, recent changes to the Planning Act necessitate the expedient processing of development applications to speed up decisions on land use planning and facilitate new housing. Further changes to the Planning Act affect sections of the official plan dealing with community benefits and site plan control. And further legislative changes are, are proposed and will be uh, discussed later in this council meeting. Of significant concern is Bill 109 requires processing of official plan, zoning bylaw and site plan applications within 60 to 120 days from deeming application complete. If these deadlines are not met, the city will be required to refund application fees. To ensure complete applications uh, and processing of applications within required timelines, a more fulsome pre-consultation process should be implemented. In addition, policy should allow for clearing of conditions before development occurs when council is satisfied an application meets good planning principles. Uh, there are other in initiatives we're working in tandem with this official plan amendment. Uh, guidelines are being developed to assist applicants in preparing uh, applica or applicant uh, studies. Um, and to further assist applicants, the city is revising its site plan control guidelines. And finally, guidelines will be included in new application package to ensure applicants are able to easily access, sorry, access all information required to make a complete application. Open House was held on November 8th and was attended by a number of uh, residents as well as uh, members of the development community. Uh, there were a few uh, comments and concerns raised. Uh, uh, the legality of introducing a pre-submission step into the, uh, the pre-consultation uh, uh, step was uh, raised. Uh, staff uh, basically checking applications for completeness for, for uh, uh, the applicant our application completeness will take place within the current complete application review step that's uh, enshrined in the Planning Act. Uh, there were concerns about engaging the public on planning matters and further review of how the public is engaged should be considered as part of a broader communication strategy. Uh, concerns were raised about photometric studies uh, and if, if they look at impacts on natural heritage. Uh, uh, these studies may be required where a site contains a natural heritage feature that may be sensitive to flood lighting. Uh, there were concerns about the removal of a natural heritage uh, protection and site plan agreement matters. Uh, these policies are not recommended to be removed. And finally, uh, there was uh, some comments on uh, how to improve pre-consultation process. Uh, these uh, will be considered uh, pre-consultations will include the approving of terms of reference and finally submission meetings with applicants before the application is submitted will be encouraged. Uh, the uh, proposed changes, uh, some changes are being proposed to the holding policies, uh, basically addition of a policy uh, to allow council to place a hold zone to complete any necessary studies and implement recommendations of these studies. Uh, this will assist council moving forward with a decision when they're satisfied uh, the proposal meets good planning principles. 
Uh, as a housekeeping measure, current bonus zoning policies are proposed to be deleted and replaced with a new community benefits charges subsection. Uh, these will align with the, um, the, the bylaw that Council passed uh, in the summer. A uh, few changes are being proposed to site plan control. Uh, changes to the policies are intended to reflect uh, Bill 109 changes. That's the delegation of site plan approval to staff. Uh, changes are also proposed to allow delegation of the preparation of site plan guidelines to staff. Uh, policies uh, have also been made to allow for conditional site plan approval, uh, to allow for staged approvals, and finally, these changes will assist in meeting the new timelines. Uh, changes were, uh, a few changes are proposed to pre-consultation, basically to ensure timelines are met and applicants applications are proposed efficiently. Uh, the city's uh, current pre-consultation process uh, is proposed to be uh, uh, improved to specify the preparation of terms of reference where necessary. Uh, the, the review of, uh, of an application for completeness would take place under the current Planning Act provisions for deeming an application complete. And finally, uh, studies and information would need to meet uh, the various requirements of the province, uh, the region, and city policies, and any approved terms of reference. Uh, a number of studies uh, are proposed to be added to the complete application. This section already includes a rather uh, extensive list of studies that staff uh, or, or basic may be identified uh, to be uh, supplied with an application uh, if necessary. And it's noted that although many of these studies are already identified or already requested, uh, just adding these to the list will formalize a request and ensure the council has the right information to make an informed decision. And finally, a policy is recommended to be added to allow the general manager to determine if substantial changes to an application require a new application. Uh, this will ensure uh, any delays in obtaining studies to support the changes or engaging the public uh, will not result uh, in uh, any, any delays in the application or any kind of penalties uh, because the application wasn't processed in time. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the recommendation is that Council approve the amendments as outlined in this report and in the draft official plan amendment shown in Appendix A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Mr. Bryce. Uh, I've got Councillor uh, Strange. Any questions of Council? Councillor Strange and Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you to uh, uh, Andrew. Um, with these time restraints, are, are we going to be forced to hire more staff in the planning department? And if so, is, is there a way to recoup those costs through increasing fees at, at the application process? Uh, yes, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, the, the hiring of new staff may be required. Uh, we are reviewing our planning application fees uh, to see if uh, if they need to be increased. So we're looking at possibly hiring a couple more planners, possibly in the future? Yes, uh, through sure you, is. Mr. Mayor. <laughs> and, uh, Thank Ms. you. Uh, through you to the Councillor. Um, yes, so we, are, we will be putting forward budget um, request items for new staff members. Right now we're still working out the details on how many, uh, but we do, we do know we will need some staff members to process those applications in a timely fashion. Currently, uh, the current processing timelines that we currently have, we're not meeting any of those targets. So, um, out of, for example, out of 40 applications, we've met two. So obviously the staff, the staffing is gonna be a key component <coughs> for us to meet those targets. We are doing a number of other initiatives as well uh, to streamline approvals to try to uh, speed up the process uh, in addition to requesting for staff. And more likely the fees will go up, I'm sure, for applications. And That's correct. So in 2023, we do have an item in, in the operating budget that we're looking at for a planning fee study review uh, to make sure that we're getting some cost recovery. We'll probably never get 100% unless you really want to jack up those yeah. fees, but um, we will be looking for, for an increase in those fees uh, as we go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pierangelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. My questions were actually along the same lines. I mean, I know the theme of City Hall has always been that development should pay for development. And since the province is imposing tighter timelines, I know we're going to have to hire more staff. I was wondering as well whether or not there was going to be any cost recovery through the increase of fees. But I think Ms. Dole just covered it fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Do we have any other questions of Council for Mr. Bryce? Okay, thank you for that. Give me one half a second here. Um, 
Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will, will result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 17 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone who wishes to speak to the proposed amendment. Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone who wishes to speak? Uh, yes, Your Worship, uh, we did have Mr. Rocky Vaca. Uh, he did send his written correspondence in earlier today, uh, so he's not going to be speaking this evening. Uh, but first off, uh, we do have Mr. Chuck McShane on behalf of the Niagara Builders Association, and I believe he is on Zoom. We'll connect him momentarily. Yes, I'm here, thank you very much. Okay, Mr. McShane, uh, welcome to the meeting. Uh, the floor, you've got five minutes and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Mayor Diodotti and council members, as well as staff for allowing me to speak on a proposed OPA 154. I can certainly guarantee you, Mr. Mayor, that you are right after hearing the incredible rendition of our national anthem that singing in public is more difficult than speaking in public. Therefore, I've decided not to I've decided to save you all and let you know that I've decided not to sing my delegation. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Chuck McShane and I'm the CEO of the Niagara Home Builders Association, which is comprised of over 170 member companies that re represent the developers and new home builders, as well as the trades that construct the much needed homes in the Niagara region. With regards to OPA 154, this OPA seems to defy the intent and spirit of Bill 109, which was to speed up the approvals process to get more homes to the market faster. The sole intent behind OPA 154 seems to be avoidance of having to refund applica planning application fees. It won't actually speed up the overall time frame of the development approval process. Our industry requires a reasonable level of certainty and reliability in order to invest millions of dollars into a project. OPA 140, 154 is likely to make that certainty worse by requiring final approval of subjective technical study requirements in advance of deeming an application complete. This has the unintended consequences of removing appeal rights if and when proposals reach an impasse at the staff level. It takes decision-making powers out of the hands of elected officials and it allows under-resourced municipal staff, which we just spoke of, which you just spoke about, to kick the can down the road and to buy themselves more time by moving the goalposts and evolving the study requirements. I can assure you that the NHBA is not suggesting that this is the motive of the city staff, and in fact, have been ensured that it is not. I have spoken at length with uh, Ms. Dolch and your staff. However, this is a possibility and an unintended consequence and a precedent that could be followed elsewhere. This has the potential to be abused and influenced by political interests in a way that isn't transparent or accountable. On November the 1st, the region hosted a workshop with developers to receive feedback on a wide array of industry from a wide array of industry professionals, which the city's planner of uh, uh, planning director attended. These concerns were raised along with others, and we need to understand that Bill 109 was implemented to speed up the approval process. However, many municipalities appear to be rushing to implement a circumvention to avoid having, having to refund fees ra rather than collaborating with stakeholders to find workable solutions to getting more housing built faster. As important as these application fees are to the operations of the municipality, the city should consider the burden they place on themselves by not helping builders provide attain the attainable housing supply that is required. Not only does it in inhibit assessment growth, 
but it places the financial burden to, to house those who can't afford to house themselves on the levy. Our already burdensome demands on the levy are made worse by the housing and social service demands when developers are restricted from building new inventory. With additional reforms coming from both Bill 23 and the governance review, we respect, respectfully suggest the city pause this initiative to give all those involved in the production of housing an opportunity to find real solutions. We need to fundamentally change how we do things and how we perceive housing and development in our communities. We are in a housing and cost of living crisis. We're desperately in need of homes to keep up with the growing demand. The lack of housing affordability is unprecedented in this country. And with the unprecedented immigration targets we urgently need to find solutions. And with the proposed OPA, our members lack confidence that this will shorten the development timelines. I'll leave you with this. Developers don't want their application fees back. They want their approvals as quickly and reliably as possible so they can continue to build homes, drive the community, the economy, grow our communities and restore the hope to young families and newly arrived Canadians. Thank you and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. McShane. Do we have any questions of council for Mr. McShane? Okay, looks like, looks like we're good. Thank you very much, appreciate your, your submission. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. You too. Uh, Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone else who wishes to address council? Uh, there's no one else registered online to speak. I, I do know we have a few people in the gallery. I'm not sure if anyone here is actually here to speak to the official plan amendment or not. Is anybody here for the official plan amendment? No? Okay. All right. Well, then um, we'll move along. So are there any final questions or comments of council before we move on? Okay, seeing none, the public meeting with respect to the proposed official plan amendment is now concluded. Does a member of the council wish to make a motion regarding the official plan amendment? Okay, motion by Councillor Thompson for uh, approval, a seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. Do we have any discussion to the motion? Uh, I'm sorry, Councillor Thompson, did you want to speak to it? I just want to say I think this is a very positive move. And uh, when you get concerns from people at a, for development and the planning, uh, has more people and, and it's going to improve. And I'm uh, really... Uh, supportive of this. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a lot of challenges with this. I understand that we need more housing. Um, I feel that the provincial government is trying to push this along very quickly. At the beginning, we weren't asked for comments. I know we did put comments in because we were so concerned about it. Um, I don't think anyone really knows what the full impact on any municipality is going to be. There's a lot of challenges. I think our staff are doing the best thing that they, they know how to do is protect our residents, work with the stakeholders. Um, they're gathering lots of information, um, but I, I'm opposed to these amendments as they sit. Okay, thank you for that. Any, any other questions or comments of, of council? Okay, seeing none, uh, yes, Councillor Strait? Sorry, I just have a question. I would, did you get a letter from Matt Kernan? Microphone, please. <laughs> um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, possibly Ms. Dolch, we did get some, some uh, added, uh, it says further improvements to the application review process. I don't know if, if you can weigh in on any of that, of, of Matt Kernahan's letter, and, and if any of those um, improvements would be, would be good for us. Thank you, Ms. Dolch. Any kind of feedback? 
Thank you, uh, thank you, Your Worship, through you to the Councillor. Uh, so I have spoken with, with Matt Kernahan uh, on his comments that he's issued, and we have agreed that what we're going to do after this OPA is approved is do an implementation guide. A lot of his concerns result, uh, is a result of implementation of the OPA and the pre-consultation process and how it moves through the process. The concerns really lie on how each staff member will treat pre-consultation, how studies will be reviewed, those kinds of things. So those are part of the implementation guide that we'll implement to make sure we have level playing field for everyone. Uh, that implementation guide will be discussed with the home builders. Uh, I appreciate Mr. McShane's comments. Uh, we'll discuss it with them as well as, as other developers and uh, members of the public. Good with that. Okay, yeah, Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, through you, perhaps, either to our CAO or to Ms. Dolch, um, the changes that are part of this report are part of Bill 109 that the province has passed. Is that is that correct? Ms. Dolch? Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to the Councillor. So Bill 109 obviously was put into place with certain timelines in place. Um, Amendment 154 that Mr. Bryce has worked on is is trying to make sure we can implement those changes at a staff level. So there is some things that we've put into place in that amendment, such as um, conditional site plan approval. So right. things to help streamline that process to make sure that we as staff can meet those timelines. Because again, as I said uh, earlier uh, to Councillor Strange, we, we do, want, do need additional staff, but we're trying other measures as well to uh, try to streamline that process in the end not have to one refund money or um, in the end just make development faster so we can get more homes in the ground and that I understand um, do municipalities have the right to project the timelines that are part of bill 109 Ms. Dolch? thank you your worship through you to the council no we don't uh, bill 109 is in place the timelines are there um, so in terms of we shall refund the money, we shall refund if we don't meet those timelines. Mm. So. Okay. So, oh, sorry, Mr. Burgess. Yeah. Mr. CIO, want to weigh in? Yeah, th through the mayor to the councillor. Uh, some municipalities aren't prepared uh, to adopt this, and there's recognition. In fact, some municipalities are budgeting the refunding or the non-collection of planning fees. Uh, and th that's not really our, our main concern here. At the end of the day, the timelines are being set by the province for uh, ready impact. So regardless of the fees, uh, we still need to be able to move those applications forward. Uh, so many of these changes are there to essentially put pressure on our staff uh, to make sure that the first meeting uh, is, you know, has the appropriate amount of atten uh, attention to it uh, so that when the development application comes in, we can assure a smoother process. So there's some emphasis on our staff to get the upfront planning right on that so that we can meet these timelines. As Ms. Dolch said, uh, you know, we're quite good at the City of Niagara Falls for moving applications through, but even us being good, we are still f falling far behind the, the standard that's being set by the province. So I don't want to take the approach that some other municipalities had, and I do respect uh, Mr. McShane's thoughts that you know, some municipalities are setting up things just to get out of it. What we are honestly trying to do is to meet the timelines as set up by the province, and that's going to require significant changes. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that as we put the implementation guideline in, we'll be working with the industry. Uh, this council has to make a commitment for 8,000 new homes. We'll be reporting back to council on our uh, advances, probably on a semi-annual basis. <coughs> I'm sure there'll be lessons learned. Uh, through this process as we go through it after six months we'll need to tweak we'll need to make some changes to our process one of the important things in this is it gives uh, uh, our general manager planning the ability to make those tweaks uh, during the process so that we can make changes quickly to address the timeline so we're doing everything we think we can to, to meet that but um, the councillor's comment is though other municipalities can't reject those timelines uh, some are planning not to meet them, and that's not our plan. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Uh, so if there's no further comment, we have a motion by Councillor Peter An um, Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo, that we support the recommendation by staff to approve the amendments to the official plan as outlined in the report. So we're gonna call the vote. All those in favor? 
Okay, and opposed with one opposed. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Bryce. And All right, Mr. Clerk, would you please introduce the next item on the agenda? Public meeting is now being convened to consider a draft plan of vacant land condominium at 5940 Carlton Avenue. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on October 21st, 2022, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of council's decision shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting or by signing the sign-in sheets located outside the council chamber. Okay, thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, we would now ask that our, our planner, Alexa, if you would please explain the purpose of the application. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, good evening, Mayor Diodotti and members of council. Tonight, I'll be giving a brief presentation regarding a vacant land condominium at 5940 Carlton Avenue. Subject land is on the east side of Carlton Avenue, south of Lundy's Lane. Surrounding the property is primarily single detached dwellings to the west, south, and east, and commercial uses to the north. In 2019, the lands were rezoned a site-specific R4 zone to permit the proposed 19-unit townhouse development. Now a vacant land of condo application has been submitted to separate the land into 19 units for individual sale and lands in common. Part of the proposal, as you can see, is the 19 townhouse units. Uh, there is a private road as well as 11 visitor parking spaces. An open house was held in 2019 as part of the zoning file that was processed in 2019. Um, some of the concerns received from that open house as well as letters received uh, to date include traffic. Transportation staff stated Carlton Avenue can accommodate the additional traffic without reducing the level of service. There was concerns about fencing and privacy. Uh, the applicant agreed to provide a fence along the perimeter of the subject lands and this has been made a condition of draft approval. There were concerns about servicing capacity. Sanitary can accommodate the proposed development in a condition to extend the storm sewer from Spence Street north to the frontage of the subject <coughs> property has been included. Uh, parking, concerns with parking, lot size and roadway width internal to the uh, proposal. These meet the required regulations of zoning bylaw 79200 as amended. Snow removal, this will be addressed by the condominiums uh, board if approved. There were concerns for construction noise. Uh, the construction noise is required to be in compliance with the city's noise bylaw. If it is ever in contravention, um, members of the public can make a complaint through our bylaw department. There were concerns for lighting. So street lights proposed for the development are required to have zero light tras trespassing onto neighboring properties. This is a condition of draft plan approval. There are concerns about fire route. Uh, the proposal, again, is required to meet fire route regulations, and this is included in the draft plan conditions. And there were also, finally, concerns about garbage collection, uh, which will be in accordance with the region's waste collection requirements, which, again, uh, is a condition of draft plan approval. So an analysis, as mentioned, was completed through the rezoning application in 2019. The proposal conforms to provincial, regional, and local policies. It also complies with the site-specific zoning on the property. Consideration of 51 section, uh, subsection 24 of the Planning Act, the development conditions are not premature on this property, and site plan matters will be addressed prior to registering an agreement on title through draft plan conditions. Staff's recommendation is that Council approve the draft vacant land of condominium application subject to the recommendations contained and staff report PBD 2022-071 on tonight's agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions of council for Alexa? Seeing none, council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the draft, draft approval plan of vacant land condominium. Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone who, who wishes to speak? Yes, Your Worship, we do have two registered online. Uh, the first being Matt Kernahan. OK, 
Okay, and he, since he's not present, let's go to William Haikoop. William Haikoop is from Upper Canada Planning and Engineering Limited, and I believe he's on Zoom. Okay. Mr. Haikoop, are you there? Yes, Mr. Mayor, thanks for having uh, me this evening. Uh, um, I do have a brief PowerPoint presentation for Council. Um, however, I think Alexa has done a great job giving an overview of, of the proposal. Um, this is, is something that has been in front of Council in the past. Um, I am at uh, your disposal if you want me to move forward uh, with that presentation. Um, otherwise, if, if there's any questions of Council, I'm happy to answer those. Council, are there any questions for Mr. Haiku? No questions? Okay, it looks like uh, we don't have any questions on this end. Okay, fantastic. That's, uh, that's it for me. If, if you need anything further, uh, if there's any comments from the public that you'd like me to address, I'll be here. Okay, that's great. Thank you for that. Mr. Clerk, have we tracked down Mr. Kernahan? Uh, Your Worship, doesn't appear there's anyone else online. Again, uh, you might want to just uh, uh, give the, those present in the gallery an opportunity, if that is why they're here, to speak to this uh, uh, draft plan of condominium on Carleton Avenue. So is there anybody here that wants to address council about the condominium on Carleton Avenue? Yes, you'd like, okay, if you'd like to come on up to the microphone here, if you would. Just like if you could state your name and your address, please, for the record. Marianne Seppala, 6106 Corwin Avenue. Corwin Avenue is one street west of Carleton. And this whole area, Spence, Lundy's Lane, Drummond, Culp, and Dorchester are very dense to the point where a few years ago, when the Boys and Girls Club property was developed to 13 houses, the residents of that area are now parking their cars in Bridge Park parking lot. It is far too dense. And what I'm saying to you is, you have to consider the quality of life. Not one person tonight has talked about the environment, or the quality of life. The accessibility to the main arteries, Lundy's Lane and Dorchester and Drummond, are gridlocked now. Our infrastructure cannot handle the density that we have now. And yet you're proposing a super density in an area that is really zoned for single family occupancy. It is just imperative that this council consider the future, not just now or this generation, but the generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Ms. Seppala? Anyone of council have any questions? Okay, thank you for that. Uh, do we have anyone else that would like to address council on this topic? Yeah, that's okay. If you'd please state your name and your address, please. Uh, hi, my name is Antoinette Brunzo. Uh, it's 5926 Carlton, where you're wanting to put the street. I agree with this lady here. There's a school there. There's too much congestion now, and now you're going to put a street through there and all those condos? I think, I think it's wrong. Like, we gotta, got to be careful with the kids. Like, it's bad now. The, what she was saying about the parking and that... We can't even pick up our children. Like, I don't live there, but my grandchildren do go there. My parents own the house there. And it's hard to get those kids because there's too much parking there from everybody else. Thank you. Do we have any thank questions uh, for our speaker? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Councilor Strange. Just for, uh, sorry, Mr. Strange, just from the first speaker, maybe we can get uh, Ms. Dolch to, I know she was talking about the infrastructure and, and, and can, can it hold um, I don't know if it was water or what it was, but just the infrastructure problem and the density problem. And um, I don't know if you know about this project and can it hold that and can it hold uh, what she's talking about? 
parking yeah, and whatever it may be. Just for clarity, um, this is an application, and any developer that makes an application to the city, it's our it's incumbent upon us to entertain the development, and then we need to figure out if it's something that works and if it's within the provincial guidelines of development. So maybe, Ms. Dolch, if you could just help us maybe give a little bit of a overview on that. Thank you, and, and I'll probably take it from a bit of a high level, and if Alexa wants to jump in as well in the details, but in terms of the, the traffic, servicing constraints, those kinds of things, we did uh, confirm with Municipal Works, they have reviewed the applications that are before you tonight, and uh, transportation staff um, said that Carlton Avenue can accommodate the the traffic generated from this site. In terms of servicing capacity, the same thing applies. Sanitary can accommodate the development. There is need for an extension of storm sewer, though. And I don't know if there's anything else, Alexa, I'm missing. Um, to address the density, it is within the official plan uh, permissions. It's about 9, 29 uh, units per hectare, and the official plan permits for 20 to 40 units per hectare along Carleton Avenue. Okay. Do we have any other questions of council for any of our speakers in the audience or of our staff? Okay. Uh, yes, Councillor Baldinelli. Uh, I was just elaborate on the Is your microphone on? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Can you elaborate for me on the, uh, the extension of the storm sewer system and where that would be going? Is that going into a combine or is that actually extension? Through your worship to the councillor, uh, Mr. Eric Nichol will, will comment on that. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the reason that an extension is required is because the frontage of the property on Carlton Avenue um, is not within an area that the storm sewer extends to. So there is a, a small extension of the storm sewer, but the sewer that it is connecting to has the capacity. So um, it's, if there's not a combined system, it's simply an extension of a system where, there, where none exists today. Mr. Matson, do we have anyone else who wishes to address council on this topic? Uh, no, there's not, Your, Your Worship. Okay. Any final questions of council before we close the public meeting? <clears throat> okay. The public meeting with respect to the proposed draft approval plan of vacant land condominium is now concluded. What's the will of council? Council Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I really have a challenge with this. We're here to support our residents. I talked with Mrs. Zapala earlier um, a couple of weeks ago about all of the development around in the area and she talked to me about the Boys and Girls Club and the parking issue. And we seem to keep hearing about parking issues in our city. I know we're supposed to get away from having certain numbers of parking spots and get more to transit and um, active uh, participation on bike trails and all of that, but the reality is there are a bunch of cars out there. And I know that the parking requirements fit what we're supposed to have. And this is where I, I have a, a problem with. The provincial guidelines set out certain things for us. The regional guidelines set out certain things for us. Our staff do all of this work, put, put the um, recommendation together based on all of those guidelines. And I'm not sure what we're supposed to do as a council. We have residents that we're supposed to protect their, their quality of life and their property, but we have guidelines for development about what we're supposed to do. And, and sometimes they're very competing and conflicting. And, and I really feel for the residents, but these are our guidelines and I don't know what to do, especially about the parking, because I'm seeing it happen over and over again. And we can see some of our new developments that have um, parking issues, but yet they fit within the guidelines about what we were supposed to do. So I, I just wanted to put it out there. I, I'm really struggling with this. So maybe and you make a good point. And here's the dilemma that we're in. And, and this is to the residents as well. So a typical situation, we have a, 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 an application that staff support based on provincial and regional guidelines and our own official plan. They fit in. And if council turns it down, the developer takes it to the LPAT and they get overturned. And you can almost guarantee that's what's gonna happen next. So that's why we try to work with the developer to work with the things we don't like, because otherwise we're gonna get something that we have no say in, and I've seen it happen so many times. So we try to find, so Councilor Coco brings up a really good point, parking. So they're parking in our park. And part of the problem is these new big pickup trucks don't fit in a lot of the small driveways. The other one, sometimes there's multiple people with multiple cars. 
what do we do with these types of situations? So, and I'm, I'm winding it up to pass it to staff, and I'm, I'm asking you to give me an answer that maybe is impossible to answer. But if you can help us understand what do we do, like Ms. Seppala said, you know, what do we do? And right now, we've got these extra cars, nowhere to put them, and we're gonna add more dwellings, and there's gonna be more of the same. And we know not everybody uh, drives cars, and we try to do these denser developments along arterial roads where we have transit, with the idea that they don't all drive or they won't all drive or, or whatever the case may be. So is there any official planning answer for this type of a dilemma that we're in right now? Thank you, Worship. Um, so let me start by saying, uh, yes, in certain instances, obviously, we don't require parking sometimes for higher density development near transit. In other areas, um, we do require more parking because there's um, four or five people living in a house, right? And, and we're not accommodating for that right now. Um, so it is a bit of a mixed bag and our bylaw only specifies one number, that's it. And I know uh, Mr. Nichols' group in Public Works is looking at the parking and how to address <coughs> that situation in the future. So uh, next year he is looking at that parking study work. So that's something we, we've obviously heard loud and clear from this council. So he will be looking at that to, to address those issues that we're seeing now. Unfortunately, it doesn't answer you today, <laughs> um, but the bylaw is what it is today. Okay, I think I appreciate that, and I thank you for that. Um, well, here's our situation. We've got. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we got a question by Councillor Strange, and then Councillor Campbell. And Mr. Mayor, you made a good point because you know what? It, it, you know the province. We're designated by them on their official plan, and this we need housing. I do feel for for um, these residents because. And, and nobody wants change like that. They don't want density and they don't want over parking. And if we do turn this down, it's going to go to LPAT. And we know, maybe the CAO can explain, I'm sure it's 100%, it's going to get changed back over. And then we have to try to hire a planner to defend our position, which we'll never be able to hire a planner. And I don't know if the CAO can maybe speak to it. Yeah, Mr. CAO, maybe just kind of walk us through what, what's going to happen next, uh, should it not pass. Yeah, the counselor is correct. If um, if you have an affirmative uh, direction from your professional planner who's guided, there's two people I can't control and council can't control, and one's the planner, uh, or there's three actually. One's the chief building officer, and the other one is the fire chief. They all operate under acts of the province that they have to provide their opinions on. Um, so when the planner provides an affirmative opinion that this is compliant with the rules, uh, council can still decide to um, go against that opinion, uh, but then our planner and our city staff are called as witnesses against council at that point in time. Uh, this council heard from another lawyer recently that it's a much easier case when you're fighting a council when you get to call uh, your own staff as witnesses. So it is a high success rate at that point in time. That's if this plan. That's if. This council could actually find a planner that will provide a different opinion than Ms. Dolch uh, will. And that's a rarity in itself. And you also have to get your own independent council. And now with the new rules under OLT, you're also su subject to cost, which unfortunately the taxpayers uh, would then uh, bear. Uh, so that's why when Ms. Dolch in the planning department gives a an opinion, it's a considered opinion. Uh, that is more aligned with the regulations because that's what they are, um, you know, that's what that's what their professional opinion is, is to provide for. So it is a difficult position for council. Um, you know, we will try with other tools in our toolbox with uh, parking regulations. We're in discussions with, um, you know, our parking teams to take a look at, are there other ways to, for enforcement to provide better uh, forms of living with some of the developments that happen. Uh, but unfortunately, council is in a, uh, the proverbial rock in a hard place with these uh, decisions. Does that answer your question, Councillor Strange? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Apparently the uh, intensity of this development is somewhere between 20 and 40. Am I correct? Ms. Dolch? Units per hectare? Alexa? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So the specific uh, density for this proposal is about 29 units per hectare, and the allowance along Carleton Avenue, since, it, since it's a local road, is 20 to 40 units per hectare. 20 to 40. Yes. 
Um, is there any possibility because of the concerns with respect to parking that we can table this, not vote against it, table this and have it go back to the developer with respect to our concerns about parking and the possible negotiations of reduction in the intensity such that there will be adequate parking in the, the development? Let's get an answer on that. Uh, who uh, here of the staff would like to handle this one? Ms. Dolch, are you going to do it? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so as uh, the CEO was just alerting to you, is the fact that obviously if, if you do delay the decision, they can appeal a non-decision. Uh, just based on timing, that is a possibility. But I do want to stress that this this was a matter already before this council, uh, so the zoning was already approved. So this was, you know, this was already contemplated prior to, and the council did approve this up the, the previous application. So I do want to caution you on that as well, uh, that this isn't a new application before you. It has been previously approved by council, not necessarily for the condominium uh, and the creation of the condominium, but previously as part of the zoning. Thank you. Any other questions of council? Okay, so here we are. Uh, the public meeting uh, with respect to this plan has been uh, concluded, so it's time that we need to make a decision to move forward. So what is the will of council? Councilor Strange? I, I so move, but can I add something that we l maybe look into, and I, I don't even know if it was direct parking with this development, it was more for, uh, I guess it was the old Boys and Girls Club down by Bridge Street Cole? Park or whatever it may be. Can we look for some alternative possibilities for parking down there or something? And can we just, before you make that motion then, uh, who would we ask? Would that be Mr. Nickel on uh, <laughs> Yeah, some... through Mr. Mayor, I'd need a bit more information on the location and the nature of the problem. We can initiate a parking study, uh, traffic study to look at uh, speeding and those things, but I don't know can, where Can we maybe get it off the residence here tonight? as a separate kind of Absolutely. motion then? and We then can take that back. Um, if the resident wants to connect with me, I can provide my card and we can take that back as initiate a study to look at the parking issues. Okay, that I'll, exist I'll, I'll move the, the recommendation. Okay, so uh, motion by Councillor Strange uh, with the addition that uh, staff engage with the residents around a traffic and parking study for the area. Okay, uh, do we have a second? Second by Councillor Thompson. Do we have any discussion to the motion of council? Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, sorry, Your Worship, for asking the question now, but is there a site plan for this uh, development? A site plan? Right. Miss uh, uh, either uh, Alexa or uh, Ms. Dolch, is there a site plan? Since this is going through a uh, draft plan of vacant land of condominium, there's no site plan application as part a part of it. Site plan matters will be addressed through uh, the draft plan conditions for the proposal. Okay, I just thought it would be a good way to include the residents, Your Worship. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so we have a motion by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Thompson, that we approve the re recommendation with the proviso that staff are going to engage with the residents to do a parking and traffic study in that area. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. One conflict. In one conflict, with one conflict. Say thank you to the residents for coming out tonight. Appreciate your time and thank you, Alexa, for presenting. <clears throat> so we are now in our capital budget portion of our meeting. I'd ask our city clerk if you would walk us through the pr process to, uh, yes? Uh, oh, yeah, okay, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. We'll just, yeah. we'll give Councillor uh, Newestag a chance to Come back in. Is uh, do we know where she is? I think she was waiting for James to get to the podium. That was the signal I gave her. So James might need to walk up to the podium again and and then make the noise of the macaw, the macaw sound. I think that's how oh, we left it. No, oh, there we go. Okay. I'll give you this one. Now. So just before we do, uh, yes, Councillor. Just a quick Can't question. Yes. Is it necessary for someone with a conflict to leave the room? 
Uh, that's a good question. It's not typically traditionally what we've done here. Maybe I'll go to the clerk and ask for uh, some uh, input on that. Uh, yes, that, uh, that has been past practice and that's what we've been following last term. It is in the procedural bylaw and I instructed Councillor Neustag that whenever there's a discussion on a conflict that has been declared, the procedural bylaw states that the councillor should leave the room. If, it's, if there's a conflict and there's just a, a vote with no discussion, the councillor does not le need to leave the room. So that, that is part of the uh, procedural bylaw. I know we haven't always done that. And, and I think the last term of council was odd in that we Zoomed, you know, we had these, these COVID meetings. It was just an odd, it was an odd time for, uh, for almost three years. So, but, but that's, uh, we're, the, the clerk's trying to clean us up in our procedural bylaw so that we follow procedure, which we haven't always done perfectly. And especially for the sake of our new councillors, we want to learn the, the right rules, not us teaching us, teaching them, uh, you know, yeah, so thank you for that, Mr. Clerk. So now that we've got Councillor Strange back, and we've, or we lost Councillor Strange, we have Councillor Newest Day, um, we're gonna uh, now switch seats, and, and uh, I'm gonna ask for a motion of Council, but I'll ask our clerk to walk us through this, please. Well, as, as a great segue, uh, Mr. Mayor, into uh, trying to clean up procedurally, now that we're at the start of a new term, uh, I know it's been past practice to have uh, Councillor Peter Angelo serve as the chair of the Finance Committee. We don't have a finance committee per se, but we do have all of council make those decisions when it comes to uh, finances and especially the, the budgets. Uh, so I think it would be appropriate to capture a motion if we are gonna continue that practice to have Councillor Peter Angelo chair these portions of the meetings that we just have him appointed as the uh, council, budget, uh, council budget chair. Did you get that out? Okay, we got that out. So I'm looking for a motion to appoint Councillor Peter Angelo to chair the budget portion. Yeah. Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor uh, Thompson. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? That's unanimous. All right, thank you for that. And I'm going to switch seats with Councillor Peter Angelo. Take me to Rico's? <laughs> Don't worry, I won't need him. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Your Worship. Thank you, Council. I know we've all been introduced to our new capital budget. We also have Mr. James Dowling, uh, who's gonna give council a brief presentation. So Mr. Dowling, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mayor, members of council and the public. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to present the 2023 capital budget to you today. For those of you who may not know me, my name is James Dowling and I'm the senior manager of capital accounting with the city. Da, da, da. Can I advance, there we go. So just a brief agenda, um, we'll go over a bit of a brief introduction. I wanted to look back at 2022 as there was some activity throughout the year that I think is worthy of highlighting. Uh, we'll do a quick at a glance of the 2023 capital budget, um, a brief talk on asset management and some of the implications for our budget, um, some key highlights and then, and then next steps. So before I get too far into this, I do want to say that while, um, you know, while I am the face of the budget today, um, I represent a lot of people across the organization that have put in a lot of effort. So um, you know, I do extend sincere gratitude to a lot of my colleagues across the city for all of their time and effort submitting all of these projects. I mean, before you today, uh, many of you would have seen your 300 some on page book and realistically all that content is coming to us from staff. So. Um, while, I'm, while I'm the face today, I, I definitely want to give credit where credit's due and acknowledge all of their contributions as well. Just highlighting how budgets work together. So of course today we're here to talk about the capital budget. And on the slide you'll see that there's linkages to debt, to reserves, and to the operating budget. And this is really just to illustrate how interconnected they all are. So the capital budget ultimately, is, as many of you know, is there to support growth, it's there to support asset management, some strategic investments, the large capital investments for the city as a whole. Um, the operating budget makes a small operating contribution to the capital budget. Uh, there are reserves that help fund our capital budget and any surpluses from projects also go back to reserves. And of course, lately we've been leveraging some debt financing strategically to help us finance some of the larger, the, some of the larger investments that it help us sort of spread the cost over the life of the asset. It helps a little bit with that intergenerational equity piece as well. So looking back at 2022, just as a refresher, so almost exactly a year ago today, it was November 16th, 2021, we approved the 2022 capital budget. Um, 
Throughout the year, we've, there's been various touch points. So in June, we launched the capital budget process. So that was where staff received all of our templates and they were off to the races to start filling out all the information for us. In August, we brought forward a project close report, which we tried to do annually, which was meant to help close out some surpluses, some, you know, some, I guess, overspending, a little bit of underspending um, on prior year capital projects. So we actually were able to close at 92 projects. It's a great housekeeping exercise for us. And where possible, if there's any surpluses, return those to reserves to make them available for us to draw through the fall's capital budget process. So in this case, um, and you'll see on the next <coughs> slide, it, it was just over $5 million that we were able to free up in advance of the budget. Uh, as well, so in mostly in September, we had numerous budget meetings with every single department to go through their capital budget asks, their prioritization, understand their needs, and sort of help us identify how we can try to strategically fund their asks as best we can. And of course, here we are tonight with a finalized budget um, for, for all of you to review um, and hopefully approve. Throughout the year, we also had some council referred items to the budget process, so that would have been items that um, council may have identified throughout the year and either asked for them to be considered during the capital budget process or there could have been budget amendments that were asked um, that where we approved an actual amendment to the budget throughout the year. So in terms of in-year adjustments, as I mentioned before, there were 92 projects that we had closed in 2022. That was at our, during our August report. Three projects were brought forward to the 2023 budget process and we're recommending funding of two of them right now currently in the budget. Um, and as well, we had 20 projects that were brought forward throughout the year for various priorities where we amended the budget, totaling close to $18 million. So that's not a small dollar amount. In prior years, um, these would often show up as pre-approved projects. Um, as you may remember for, for the, uh, the, and the returning council members. Um, this year we tried it a little bit different and we tried to make sure that staff um, identified a funding source at the time of approval. And so we treated them truly as budget amendments this year. Now something new for 2022 is we introduced a 1% <coughs> capital levy. Um, this was a new change for us starting, starting this year. Um, for reference, 1% is about $750,000. So um, that represents about 750 meters of road that we can reconstruct um, or about three quarters of a fire truck. I know with inflation and everything these days, that unfortunately the prices continue to climb. You know, it's a really great first step for us to start building a dedicated fund for asset management, you know, and we basically just sort of need to continue that and we'll illustrate that a little bit more later in the presentation. So now taking a look at the 2023 budget. So um, of course, I, I just alluded to this, the ongoing budget pressures. So we're seeing in a lot of areas, fleet especially is being impacted by um, quite long lead times. Some of our heavy equipment, we're looking at 12 to 18 months from the time of ordering before delivery. So it, you know, it's, it's forcing us into a, a unique situation where we have to plan that much further out. Um, we're carrying our aging equipment longer until replacement. And so it's creating a pressure for us overall. Um, you know, as many of you may know, the consumer price index um, is at about 6.9% year over year from Q3 of last year. And our non-residential construction costs are up nearly 12.5%. Um, since Q3 of 2021. So those are enormous pressures, right? Normally we're not, um, we're not seeing numbers quite this large. Usually we're in the more 2% range. So it's glaring and unfortunately, you know, with the way our capital budget works, um, you know, if we're not keeping up with increasing our investment in capital, our dollars are gonna start not going quite as far as they used to. Now in terms of budget breakdown, um, this is just a quick glance. So there's 112 projects currently that were proposing, and I apologize, this should read $61.4 million in terms of gross total spend. Um, for reference, it's pretty comparable to prior years. Last year's capital budget was brought forward at about $60 million plus about $20 million that was contingent on grant funding. Um, unfortunately, some of those grants we didn't receive. So, you know, it, it ultimately grossed up to about $80 million last year when you consider that. And if we were to add on all of the, you know, the $18 million of in-year adjustments, we'd be at about that $80 million mark. So we are very consistent with where we were at last year. Considering some of the continuous funding constraints that we do have, you know, OLG money is just slowly starting to ramp back up again. Um, you know, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty impressive feat for us to be able to continue funding this. Um, but I will say that, you know, we do really need to push on um, increasing that sustainable funding to keep to be able to keep this momentum going. 
If we look at the breakdown of the budget in terms of how it's broken down between state of good repair, strategic initiatives, growth related investments and service level enhancements, um, realistically speaking, about 75%, just over, um, really is focused on state of good repair and growth related, right? And I think that's important for us to highlight at the end of the day, we need to be showing that we're being responsible at maintaining our assets, but also we're a growing city and we also need to be making strategic investments in that growth to make sure um, that you know we can we can service all of that future development. From budget spending perspective, I won't go through all of these. This is just sort of at a glance all the different buckets that we've drawn on. So, you know, we're receiving money from the water and sewer budgets, from the operating budget. We drew down on some reserves. There's definitely a lot of um, grants in play, right? We've got over seven million dollars of federal and provincial grants. Uh, OLG money, we were able to leverage quite a bit this year. Some of that is prior year money we were able to free up through closing reports, um, but some of it is net new funding that we were able to use because of our Q3 payment this year. Um, you will notice that we have a rather large debenture amount. A lot of that is funded from development charges and is sort of earmarked towards future growth, um, as well as our capital <coughs> levy reserves. So there's about 700 and almost $750,000, which was that first time use of our 1% capital levy. In the appendix to the report, uh, in appendix one, we also adjust, again, these are sort of housekeeping adjustments, some swaps and adjustments. So we did another deep dive and analysis and looked at some prior year projects where we may not have maximized all of the development charge funding or um, water sewer money that we were able to use. So we, we took a look back and were able to swap in a little bit of extra money in hopes of freeing up some funding to be able to use in the budget this year. We also swapped in some debt. So we're looking at, um, again, plow trucks were one of the largest um, areas that were hit by the supply chain delays. So we're trying to put in some larger orders and we're also looking at leveraging some debt financing because they are durable assets that do last quite a long time. We're looking at leveraging some, some debt to help sort of spread the cost over the useful life. As you can imagine, the cost of these trucks has, has gone up quite substantially. So it's a good way for us to sort of be a bit strategic there. And then with transit um, being amalgamated to the region at the end of the year, just some housekeeping exercises to adjust some of the funding there just to make the process a little bit more seamless when we transition projects over to the region. So looking at debt, you know, in the last, in last year and this year, we have increased a, a, a little bit in terms of how much debt we're, we're looking at using and leveraging. Um, we're still under about 9%. That's not too alarming. Our policy limit currently right now sits at 15%. Um, and, and our legislative limit is at 25%. Um, those percentages represent um, the percentage of our own source revenues that we can be using towards debt repayment. So, you know, we're at, we're at a really good point right now. You know, like we said, it allows us to sort of spread out that cost um, and we can, we can be really strategic with some of the ways that we're using debt. Um, and I think, you know, in, in light of there being a rising rate interest environment right now, we're, being, we're definitely being a little bit more selective of where we're recommending debt. You know, that's, there's been quite a big change in that this year. So our approach is, is changing a little bit with, with everything else going on outside of the city. Yeah, absolutely, Mayor. Uh, through you, Mr. Dowling, now, uh, the only thing I just want to ask you about, now we're at 8.65% debt, mm -hmm. um, and now you said it's not too alarming. Mm -hmm. So do you, like, are we healthy? How would you, do, like, wh how would you characterize where we are com versus where we should be? I would say we're healthy. A lot of our peer municipalities range between the 8 and 10% mark. So we're not overly high or overly low. You know, previously, as you were aware, we weren't necessarily leveraging debt as much in the past, and we were quite low. So I think this is a really good spot for us to sort of be right now. Um, you know, it isn't at a point where it's a concern to anybody. We're not anywhere near policy limits or anything like that by any means. Um, but it's, it's a good amount that's, a, that's enabling us to do some key work. For example, you know, about $13 million of the debt we're taking on this year is really to enable some of the development in the south end in the hospital area. And frankly, without leveraging debt, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be nearly in the position financially to be able to take that burden on ourselves 100%. So... Um, I think I think we're we're in we're in really good shape from that perspective. Okay, great, thank you for that. And through you, Mr. Chair, just follow up question if I could. And also, um, you mentioned our own policy maximum, mm -hmm. and then there's a provincial maximum. Mm -hmm. Just for everyone listening, I don't know if you could just let them comparatively. We're eight point six five, mm -hmm. but what are the limits both uh, municipally here and then provincial? We brought forward a debt management policy uh, this past year, earlier this year. We set a policy limit of 15% of own source revenue. 
which is, again, pretty conservative. Most municipalities are anywhere between 15 and 17 percent. Um, provincially, they mandate us at 25 percent. So we've got a lot of room where we're way far away from the provincial max. At the same time, you know, we don't want to be taking on debt frivolously either, so we're definitely being selective and careful with where we're, where we're bringing it on. And again, you know, I, I kind of alluded to this intergenerational equity, right? At the end of the day, we want to be careful about you know, what investments are we debt financing and, and where's the benefit going, right? So for some of these growth developments where it's going to benefit future generations, spreading out the cost over time so that, you know, multiple generations can pay for it is also a, kind of a smart way for us to leverage that and make it a little bit more fair for everybody. But uh, yeah, by all means, you know, it's, it's, it's not a huge concern from my perspective. And, uh, you know, we're, we're lucky in that there is going to be, you know, over time, debt does mature as well. We've got some older debt on the books that's also going to mature off. And when that finishes up, it'll free up more capacity for us. And we'll essentially right now, especially with interest rates being higher, we're just going to slow down the accumulation a little bit for the time being. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not concerned at all in terms of where awesome. we are. Thank you. Thank you. So in terms of asset management, as many of you may know, Ontario Regulation 588.17 from the province um, has mandated municipalities to adopt asset management plans. The city brought forward its core asset management plan for its large infrastructure, roads, bridges, um, sewers, water mains uh, this past summer, and that was approved by council. We're now moving ahead on the non-core asset management plan, which is focused on facilities, parks, vehicles, um, sort of the rest of the assets that weren't captured in, in the core asset management plan. Um, provincially, we're regulated to have that plan in place by July 1st, 2024. And then they've also required us to have a financing strategy and establish levels of service by July 1st, 2025. You know, ultimately, that's going to help. That's going to be the tool that helps guide our future decision making, especially when it comes to investments in state of good repair because the conversation is very quickly going to shift at that point to levels of service and approved levels of service rather than sort of a project by project basis necessarily. Again, I, I feel like I can't say this enough sometimes. So in terms of prioritizing investment, um, in our little house diagram, we intentionally put asset management down at the foundation because at the end of the day, um, you know, we do really need to have that strong foundation to grow successfully. And we really don't want, um, you, know, the, you know, the growth of the service levels to be at the expense of existing services. Um, you know, at the end of the day, our, our, this capital budget and future capital budgets are, are going to continue to be focused on, on asset management for the foreseeable future. So as I mentioned earlier, we did have this special capital levy in, in 2022, the 1%. Um, just a quick highlight in terms of how we're allocating that money this year. So some of the money is going towards asset rehabilitation, some or some early planning and designing um, of some bridge work, and the we're also focusing on studies and design. So we're, we're using it to fund a rural roads needs study and urban road needs study, which is really going to help us identify where the, where the needs lie in terms of asset management, get some condition information, and really guide some future decisions in the coming year. In terms of future outlook, um, so this graph, full disclosure, is a bit of a mix of information. So the dark gray bars currently is the information coming out of our core asset management plan this, this past year. Um, you'll notice that there's an enormous bar in terms of investment requirement in 2023, and that's because that reflects the backlog of investment where you know essentially everything all the other bars are representing where we should be investing annually that's representing sort of our infrastructure gap and where we're where we're not funding enough um, and where we need to do a bit of catch up the light blue bars are for the non-core amp and those numbers right now are just forecasted numbers forward from a 2014 study that we did currently it doesn't factor in the backlog so i will say that that bar in 2023 technically if we considered backlog would grow pretty substantially i know you know, they're in the last core asset management plan, some of our areas did not score the best in terms of conditions. So there's definitely some needs. The big message that I'd like to convey here though, ultimately is, you know, again, that sustainable funding piece. So the green line that you see on the chart is essentially where our sustainable funding currently stands in 2023. So that's funding we can rely on. It's not application-based grants. Um, it's not based on external parties necessarily. That's sort of the money we control and the money that we can kind of guarantee will always be there. 
The orange line is the state of good repair allocation. So that's basically how much we've invested in asset management and state of good repair this year. So you can see that even though we've tried to throw, you know, we throw 53% of the budget at asset management, we're still shy of where we really should be investing. And ultimately the bigger concern we have is that, you know, where we're sustainably funded isn't really quite sufficient. So that's where potentially growing the, the capital levy down the road is what can really help us move that green line upwards and help us position ourselves well to be in a bit more of a sustainable funding model from, the, from an asset management perspective. So some highlights, these are the exciting parts of the budget that I, that I like to brag about. So this is a bit of a brag reel. Um, you know, the budget this year, we're gonna be lining six, almost, you know, just over six and a half kilometers of pipes. We're replacing 45 vehicles and pieces of large equipment. You know, we're reconstructing six, almost just over six and a half kilometers of road. We're buying a new fire truck. We're, you know, rehabilitating and improving roads and sidewalks for, you know, about 21 kilometers or so worth and, and almost five kilometers of water mains being replaced. So there's some really big ticket, large infrastructure. And, you know, the underground infrastructure doesn't always get the same attention because it's not, a, you know, it's, it's kind of hidden away. And when it's doing its job, you're, you almost don't even know it's there, which is, which is almost a good thing. Um, there's also some really cool green initiatives this year. So, you know, we're starting to look more at electric technology. So we're looking at electrifying, you know, we're picking up an electric Zamboni, an electric sidewalk sweeper. We're going to be installing electric vehicle charging stations at the new Niagara Falls <coughs> Exchange that's scheduled to open shortly. We're also looking at, you know, an urban forest management plan because, you know, the tree canopy is definitely some, a, a, an important focus for us. Um, and we're investing in our in our climate change study as well this year to get that off the ground, which will really help inform some of these other decisions in terms of um, what other you know climate sensitive initiatives we'd like to invest in. In terms of improving operations, um, you know the budget includes some money for renovations for growth. You know the city is a growing city, as such our staffing complements growing, our services are growing. So this will really help us maximize the use of our of our current space to really get the most out of it. Um, and just make it a little bit more efficient for everybody to, to kind of continue working and growing in, in the current space we have. Uh, we're looking at a fleet optimization study and that's gonna look at maximizing value from fleet operations. So it's gonna look at, you know, reviewing the needs, services, is there new technologies that we can leverage, et cetera. Um, really just to try to make sure that we're getting really good value for our dollar. And some software improvements. So we're looking at a bunch of different pieces of software to help modernize um, the city of it, you know, we're looking at improving customer service, improving security, um, and efficiency overall with those service enhancements. Now some cool service improvements. So um, the budget includes development of a new pickleball facility. Um, those who love pickleball will be very excited about that. Um, out front of City Hall, we're looking at creating an outdoor destination for weddings. So City Hall's become quite popular in terms of people wanting to come and host their weddings here. So we wanted to be able to have an option for outdoors. We're looking at um, purchasing some large equipment attachments for some of our vehicles to look at bringing some services that occasionally we contract out potentially in-house. Uh, we're going to you know, look at finishing the renovation on the older adults area at McBain. As many of you may or may not know, the Coronation Center has moved its programming over to McBain and there's a dedicated space that we want to finish renovating for them. We're going to be investing in some, you know, implementing some wayfinding at, for, the, for some priority parks and trails. Um, and we're also looking at adding some equipment to forestry. Like we said earlier, with some of the needs on, on the tree canopy side of things, we do need to invest a little bit more in terms of um, our fleet and equipment to support forestry. One really neat initiative this year is participatory budgeting. So we've allocated a bucket of $200,000 for participatory budgeting this year. The focus is going to be on projects that are aligned with the recreation, culture, and parks plan. And ultimately, citizens will be able to, you know, participate and help guide that decision making. So staff are going to be launching that more formally in the new year so that citizens can get more involved in that decision making. But we wanted to secure that funding for them um, now so we can get planning on the engagement piece. And then in terms of next steps. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, finance has brought forward a couple policies already within the last couple of years between investments and debt. We're continuing to work on a reserve policy and a budget control policy. So the reserve policy is ultimately going to help us, you know, really define what reserves we have, what their purposes are, how they're to be used, some minimum balances. You know, we don't always make continuous contributions to reserves. So that policy will really help guide that. And with an asset management focus post um, creating these plans, um, I think it'll be a great tool for us to really leverage moving forward. 
the budget control policy is really just to help us identify you know, different opportunities. It'll help us guide you know, the budget decision making that we make, you know, potentially provide some delegated authority and ultimately, you know, it'll help us be a little bit more consistent in our approaches, right? So as you may be aware, you know, debt does create an operating impact on the, on the operating budget. Um, and so things like that, staffing impacts, et cetera, just making sure that we're being transparent and identifying those and levying those in the operating budget and having a policy to guide that decision making and how that's done. And then upcoming initiatives. So in finance, we're very excited about an upcoming ERP project. Um, we're looking at scoping and implementing a new financial system this year. So that's gonna be really, it'll be revolutionary for us. Um, you know, we, we do have a, an, an older system at the moment and this is really gonna help us take that next step to streamline processes, improve reporting, um, and really, really, you know, jump ahead and, and make some serious progress. So we're really excited about that. Um, we're also looking ahead to multi-year forecasting. So with the asset management planning work that's been done to date, the work that's yet to come, along with some growth related um, studies we're doing. So we're gonna be updating the DC background study um, in 2024. All of those, you know, we've got, you know, I know um, Municipal Works is working on master servicing strategies and transportation master plan. So all of those master plans, big initiatives, um, are all gonna be really key inputs into us truly getting into proper multi-year forecasting. You know, we do have a desire to get to a 10 year capital plan and, you know, be able to give you that sort of runway of what's coming. Um, we just want to make sure we've got strong inputs before we dive too deep into that. So um, things are well underway and we've got a lot of really good initiatives that are really going to help feed that exercise because it is rather data hungry. So with that, I thank you all very much for your time and I will open it up to any questions. Great. Thanks, Mr. Dowling. Very good presentation. Appreciate oh. all the insights and all the highlights. I know right. I had Councillor Thompson. Yes. You had your hand up uh, first. Yeah. I, I just want to say that it was the best um, uh, presentation I'd heard on the budget. Super. And I would be happy to move it. Okay, so I have a motion to approve all six yes. recommendations. Do I yes. have a seconder to that? Councilor yeah. Coco? Okay. Okay, sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through to Mr. Dowling. Just so I understand this correctly, because it didn't hit me until now, um, it says that there's point, point 0.54 increase going to the operating budget, and that's for debt. So I understood that. So before we even start with the operating, there's going to be a 0.54% increase to taxes, correct? So through the chair, for transparency purposes, of course, we're referring that budget pressure to the operating budget. Typically, debt isn't going to be levied immediately. It'll be levied after the work. So the best practice for us truly is to levy right at the time of approval. Um, you know, in all honesty, that hasn't necessarily been the past practice here, and that's also why we want this budget control policy in place. So it's something that we envision could be phased in. We just want to be open and transparent that there isn't zero impact to the levy. Um, I, you know, I anticipate during the operating budget process some of those items will be discussed, but you know, it is something that, is, that staff anticipate kind of phasing in over, over the course of time. So I don't want to guarantee at least for 2023 that, that that is it, but you're not incorrect in your assumption. Okay, thank you. I, I did speak with Ms. Clark and she did say it was the 0.54, so I was correct. thinking we're going into operating with 0.54. Mm -hmm. But then it just hit me that you're also talking about the 1% capital levy that we did last time and we're doing it now. So does that mean it's 1.54? for the operating or is that not right through the chair currently the one percent levy was something introduced last year that essentially is now locked in so we're keeping it separate just for transparency purposes to sort of show how the money's being spent um, but out the gate we're not immediately levying another one percent for that that's already sort of built into the existing operating budget um, you know i will say that i think you know, come the operating budget time, I think, it, you know, it's a discussion that council needs to have in terms of its will to look at increasing that 1%, but it was a transparency exercise to itemize that so that residents could see on their tax bill that they have a dedicated amount going to capital. Um, but you're correct. You're, like, essentially, in this case, um, the 1% the is not incremental on top for this year. 
Okay, thank you. So that was my question, and then just a couple comments, and then I will second it. I was really happy to see that the budget book for council and for the media and for the staff are the same one. Um, I think a lot of residents really appreciate that. And um, some residents think we just accept this without asking questions. We all had an opportunity to ask questions, and they were answered by um, not only finance department, but everybody. So I, I would like residents to understand that. And the, the other big one you talked about was the asset management backlog. Um, that's a provincial plan that we have to put in place, so we have to put money to maintain um, our assets. So th those were the big ones. Um, so I, I will um, second the motion, but I also wanted to bring up another thing. I know we just um, passed a motion to have um, Councillor Peter Angelo as the chair of the budget committee. In the last term we talked about um, budget committee and some councils have committees. We tend not to have a committee, we just have a budget chair. Um, sometimes they work with staff, sometimes they don't. So I wanted to put it out there for um, the council to see if they wanted to actually have a committee like some councils do, because I know there was talk about that last last term. Okay, thank you. So I have a motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Lococo to approve this extra recommendation. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Councillor Strange. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And through, James, uh, great job, and I'm glad you got your new financial systems. You feel that I felt you're really happy about yeah. <laughs> It's coming. We're very it's not for sure yet? No, it's coming. It's about 20 years old, I, I imagine, I think it was. You're not incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> so congratulations and, and a great job on the budget. I just wanted to talk a little bit about, as uh, Councillor Coco was talking about, the asset management plan, and, and that's something Ontario was integrating that we have to, I think, is it by 2025 or 2026 that we have to have actual in place? So 20, uh, through the chair, th uh, July 1st, 2025 is when they want us to have a true financing strategy, let's say, of how we're gonna outline the proper spend and how we're going to maintain that. So ultimately, 2025 is And, that, and is that's through every municipality in Ontario right now. That's, that's correct. So I, I imagine that a lot of municipalities are gonna be, gonna be in trouble in a couple of years, but we're doing a great job right now. And, um, and, and obviously, we have to keep some kind of inventory of our assets, and who has the, the pleasure of doing that? So, through you, Mr. Chair, it's a team effort. Oh, it's a team effort. It's a team effort. Um, <laughs> we're all pulling uh, pulling our weight to try to get uh, good data. So we have good data, we make good decisions. And I can't imagine how hard that's gonna be because I, I know a lot of, some of the inventory is, is aging. And how do you, uh, do you, do you do a scoring system or how do you do that for each asset? And, and how, like, if you can estimate how many assets we have as far as everything if, that you, it's gonna take you four years to catch up to. Yeah, Three years. <laughs> through you, Mr. Chair, um, to, to illustrate what we do know in our core asset management plan, if we were to replace all of our water, our sewer, our roads, our bridges, we'd need a $2 billion budget to replace all of that today. We haven't even begun to start talking about our facilities, our parklands, and all those other things that are part of our non-core assets. Um, we have... Uh, and we maintain quite a large inventory of parks and playgrounds, for example, and some of the best parks and playgrounds in the region. And uh, for example, we have 62 playgrounds, and um, which is uh, astonishing for us to, uh, to be able to offer that to the community. So we're gonna do full accounting for those and put a plan together that shows you know, when we need to get back into those things that we haven't been maintaining or things that are, are due for repair and put a schedule together for the next 10 years to guide council and, our budget process for decision making. Well, it seems like we're, we're getting there anyways, which is great. And uh, just congratulations to you and Tiff and your whole finance team for doing a great budget. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Any other comments before I call the vote? Okay, if not, there's a motion on the floor. I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. I'll pass it back over to the Mayor. Oh, oh, Mr. Chair. Oh. Um, j just on uh, what I was talking about was the committee. Um, I'm going to put a motion forward for discussion, really, to see where council sits on having a budget committee. Um, I, I brought it up; it was brought up in last last term, not by me, but by others as well. So I'll put the motion forward that um, the city of Niagara Falls has a budget committee, and I'll put it out there for discussion. Okay, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, we used to have all kinds of. Um, committees and if you're gonna start that on 
everybody here wants to be in involved in the financial as and I would not support a budget for the committee. And I think that's why every, and I think that's why every every decision comes back to council. It's not made at a prior committee council. meeting and that's that's what we found in the past is that decisions that were made at the committee level and then brought to council sometimes cause some frustration uh, because not everyone was involved. So in the way that we try to do it now, every single person is involved because all the all the decisions come back to council. So. Mayor Duda. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and I just want to echo that same comment, and I appreciate what Councillor Lacocco is suggesting, and, and I don't mean to be the old, we've been there, done it, it's the way it used to be, but but we used to have corporate services, and you know, and, and that was, our, and we had a budget committee, and then, and then when it would come to Council, we'd rehash it all over again, because different people weren't there, mm -hmm. they weren't part of that committee, and the way it is now, we do it, the whole committee does it, and I think this yeah. is, it's better, We're, we all got our hands on, we can meet with staff whenever we need, when we have questions about the budget, and, and Councilor, uh, Councilor Peter Angelo simply chairs the meeting. You know, That's I it. mean, we all decide. So I think I like this one personally because we're all involved and it's not two tiers, we're, we're all engaged. We used so. to have an infrastructure committee as well, and that committee and, would meet same as, and, uh, same as the finance one. HR committee yeah. and all kinds of them. Yeah, and, and then so we, we just went to the decision that all the council was going to be involved in all the decisions. Right. That's that's what I was about to say, but thank you. <laughs> Councilor DeCoco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there any other um, comments or discussions? Because I'll remove the the motion from the floor. I just wanted the discussion. I'd like to hear from other councillors if they they would like to comment on it. I don't see any. I'll remove the motion then, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is F-2022-52. This deals with the 2023 library capital budget. And Mr. Dowling, Mrs. Clark. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, we don't have a presentation for this. This is just a little report for the library's capital budget. Um, they just have one project for their collection material. It's funded 90% by development charges and 10% by a contribution from their own um, operating levy. Okay, so just looking for a motion to approve the $91,000. So moved by Councillor Thompson and seconded by Councillor Coco. I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried unanimously. The next one deals with the annual update of OLG spending and commitments. The report is F-2022-43. And the recommendations are just that council receive the report and move forward with the preferred direction. Looking for a motion to approve that yeah. by Councilor Strain, seconded by the mayor. I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried unanimously. Next one is changes to transit development charges. The report is in your agenda. Looking for a motion to approve the recommendation. Moved by the mayor and seconded by Councillor Strange. Any questions or comments? I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. And the last one for me is F-2022-55. This deals with the third quarter parking fund variance. And the recommendation is that the parking fund year-to-date report for the third quarter all the way to September 30th, 2022 be received. I have a motion by Councillor Neustag, seconded by Councillor Campbell. I'll call the vote. All those in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Now I'll pass it back over to the mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. So now we are on item 8.6, uh, Council Schedule for 2023. Uh, we're looking for uh, approval of the recommendation of staff for 2023. So, Councillor uh, Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. Do we have any other comments or suggestions? All right, let's call the vote. All those in favor? 
Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Item 8.7, we've got a number of we fa fee <laughs> waiver applications. Not we favor, but fee waiver, sorry. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Neustag, uh, that we approve the recommendation for the fee waivers. We'll call the vote, all those in favor. Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Item 8.8, .8, one call locates vendor sole source. So there's a, okay. There's a motion by Councillor Peter Angelo and seconded by Councillor Neustag, City of Niagara Falls authorized staff to enter into a contract with Ontario Utility Locates of Niagara Falls for up to one year term for provision of public utility locating services for city owned water, wastewater, stormwater, street lighting infrastructure as required by provincial legislation. We'll call that vote. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you for that. Item 8.9, hospital related Montrose Road, Bigger Road, Rexinger Road, widening and reconstruction cost sharing agreement with Niagara Region. Now we've got two recommendations here. Councillor Peter Angelo declared a conflict and is leaving the room. And I would look to see if there's any uh, insight from staff on this one. I don't know if Mr. Nickel, you had anything you wanted to share with council on this topic before we deal with it? Yep, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, to council, you've approved the 2023 capital budget, which includes a $13.6 million uh, project. It's a massive project. That's the city's contribution to the infrastructure uh, that will service the lands around the hospital and Montrose Road, Rexinger Road, and bigger roads that are city-owned roads um, in uh, cooperation with Niagara Region. Niagara Region has this project out for tender right now in order to meet the uh, new hospital timelines. It's an exciting time for us as we see the infrastructure um, out there to service the hospital and future growth. And um, what we're asking you to review and to approve is a cost sharing agreement with Niagara Region. And you've already approved the capital budget. Um, <clears throat> so we have a second recommendation that's really irrelevant. So we're asking you to uh, amend that and approve the first recommendation for the cost sharing of all that infrastructure. So okay, thank you for that. I've got a motion by Count Mona Patel, Councillor Patel, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that we move the two recommendations. And again, one that the that we be authorized to execute the cost sharing agreement between the City of Niagara Falls and the Region of Niagara for Montrose Road, Bigger Road, Rustinger Road construction, and secondly that we approve the corresponding allocation of just over thirteen million dollars from our capital budget. Okay, which you just said, and I just repeated, right? There's an echo in the room. So uh, we've got a motion by Councillor Patel, second by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Uh, does Councillor Peter Angelo have, yeah, he's declared, no, no, we've got parkland dedication. What's that? <laughs> okay, so uh, item 8.10, but then I think he's here, then he's gone. So I'm not sure, yeah. Yeah, so item 8.10, parkland dedication bylaw updates um, there is three recommendations uh, one the council passed the amending bylaws to the parkland bylaws discussed herein secondly that the city bring forward an official plan amendment to introduce privately owned publicly accessible open spaces to other areas of the city and that staff be directed to investigate the creation of pre-qualified appraisers to be made available to the public and report back to council is there anything else, uh, Mr. Nickel, you wanted to, to address there? That's Kira. Or Kira, I'm sorry, Ms. Dolch, sorry. Thank you, Worship. Uh, and if I can just, just elaborate a little bit. Obviously, we are looking for, for these publicly accessible spaces in other key intensification areas of the city. Obviously, with some changes coming down in terms of parkland dedication, possibly with Bill 23, we do need to look other places for other parklands and in terms <coughs> of the pre-qualified appraisers that's something to help streamline the process so that we don't get into um, debate or argument with developers we have a pre-approved list there's pre-approved requirements and guidelines so that's another thing so um, and generally the the basis of the amendment is just to clarify the rules of the game so that we're all on the same page we know what will be deducted what won't be deducted and what the definitions of appraisers are Thank Thanks. you for that. So we're looking for a motion uh, by Councillor Neustag. Looking for a seconder, Coun Councillor Patel. Oh. <laughs> Council Regional Councillor Crater was ready to do the seconder. He was all set, trying to jump right into the meeting. 
Okay, so we've got a motion by Councillor Newestag, second by Councillor Patel. We'll call the vote, all those in favor. Okay, and that's unanimous, thank you for that. And now we go to 8.11, and I know we've got a presentation, and we've got a whole bunch of things on this one. This is in regard to the Bill 23, the More Homes for Everyone Act 2022. So let's just call that up in our presentations. All right, and we are ready for you, sir. Um, whenever, uh, are we ready? We're, oh, go ahead, uh, Ms. Dolch is gonna introduce. Uh, Thank yeah. you, <coughs> Thank you, Your Worship, and I apologize. Mr. Dick will be doing the presentation tonight, um, and he'll be introducing the Bill 23. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. Uh, thank you. Members of Council, this is our presentation just on uh, Bill 23. It's currently uh, moving quickly through the uh, legislature. So this is it's called the uh, Bill 23. Uh, more homes. Sorry, it's Bill 23. Oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> it's Bill 23, the More Homes Built Faster Act. It does impact uh, such current legislation as the Planning Act, the Conservation Authorities Act, the Heritage and Heritage Act, the Ontario Land Tribunal Act, Development Charges Act, and Municipal Act. Uh, currently, for your information, the comment commenting period is between October 25th and November 24th, and it's currently at the second reading and at the standing committee stage. Oh, let's see if I could, oops, hang on here, my apologies. So just high level from a provincial initiatives, um, the act requires or is looking for the province to build 15, 1,500,000 new housing units in the next 10 years. And that kind of trickles down to, with respect to the city of Niagara Falls, 8,000 new units by the year 2031. Just so for council's information purposes, uh, the Niagara Regional Official Plan assigned a housing target to our municipality of about 674 units, housing units a year. This is now looking at 800 new housing units a year. But just in last year, the city issued approximately 860 building permits. So actually we're above that target currently. Uh, and then also just for council's information, our uh, supply of uh, units in the hopper is about 7,800 approved unbuilt units. We need to, uh, through that, need to develop a municipal housing pledge. Um, also as one of the other indications is um, the bill is looking at the removal of planting, uh, planning policy and approval uh, responsibilities for Niagara region. Um, and also the province is talking about potential merging of the provincial policy statement and provincial growth plan into a new sort of combined uh, policy document. So just looking at some of the implications high level, uh, we'll probably need some additional staff in the planning and building department to meet those targets. Uh, we'll also need to prepare a municipal housing pledge and uh, we'll need a complete provincial review of those uh, developments as well. Uh, also there will probably be increased operational costs and unknown costs associated with implementation of the housing pledge and new required infrastructure to make this all happen. Um, looking at from an inclusionary uh, zoning standpoint, um, the new, legisla new legislation is um, kind of caps the maximum number of affordable units at about 5% of total units or gross floor area. Those must remain affordable for 25 years and it's only really and it's only applicable with our downtown transit station, major transit station area. Uh, so just an implication, the cap may in, uh, limit the amount of affordable units that can be uh, required. Uh, if we were to do a study, we, you know, council may have chose to do 10%, but the problem says we have to do only 5% of the units. And uh, we also need to adopt our housing policies that appeared at council before for a public meeting back in August. And we need to prepare implementing a zoning amendment to uh, make this happen. Uh, looking at regulation changes from a Niagara Regional uh, perspective, Niagara Region will no longer provide comments on development applications, uh, perform any planning duties, or be able to appeal planning decisions. Uh, the new approved Niagara Regional Official Plan is now deemed to, deemed to be part of an OP of the city in the case of a conflict. So uh, just looking at implications at a high level, the city will have to absorb all the current regional planning responsibilities and duties. 
Uh, there may be a disconnect in the future between planning approvals and the timing and location of water, key water and wastewater infrastructure, which could result in a further delay or limiting the supply of service land. That's a potential implication. Uh, currently, any sort of uh, comprehensive OPs or official plan amendments are approved by regional council, and now with the region being removed, that may be the current, the potential new uh, approval authority could be the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing in Toronto. So it does have an, could have an impact on timing and the process. And also, uh, just overall, just in general, there's a substantial impact on staff review times and overall staffing to meet the process improvement times. Uh, looking at the conservation authorities, uh, Bill 23 kind of removes the ability to review and comment on development applications or supporting studies. Uh, perm permits are no longer required under certain conditions. Uh, the wetland evaluation system is being revised. Uh, the proposed changes will eliminate uh, what's called wetland, co uh, wet the concept of wetland complexing, where wetlands work in, while one wetland may not be significant, but it's complex with other adjoining wetlands and altogether holistically, comprehensively, it is environmentally significant. And also they're looking or exploring ways of having a uh, wetland offset program. Uh, so just in general implication wise, MPCA powers need to be di appear to be diluted and they as they have no commenting or appeal powers on development applications. Uh, the city will have to assume the review of environmental studies and may need to increase staff uh, expertise in this uh, area or we may need to outsource environmental review. Uh, development charges try to keep this as brief as possible. Uh, overall reduction in DCs collected, so it appears. Uh, full exemptions are provided for affordable, attainable, which isn't currently defined, nonprofit and exclusionary units. Uh, DCs are now phased in with a 20% reduction, and that gets decreased by 5% every year until, um, <clears throat> until year five, and there's DC reductions for rental housing up to 25%. Uh, there's also a requirement that the city must spend at least 60% of DC reserves for priority, priority services such as water, wastewater, roads annually. So just looking at implications, it appears that the city will collect less D DCs due to these exemptions as, um, as kind of the concept of paying for growth shifts from the development to the individual taxpayer or the service payer. Uh, the city must spend or allocate at least 60% of the DCs at the beginning of the year for water, wastewater, and other services related to roads. Uh, we can no longer use DCs to fund growth related projects such as secondary plans or DC bylaw updates. Uh, there's impacts on processing and staff related to the administration of updates of development charges, phasing of charges, interest caps, etc and impact on resources in the legal department related to the requirement for legal agreements for all development that includes exceptions from development charges. Uh, just with respect to heritage, uh, the city's 100 listed heritage properties must be designated within two years or otherwise removed from the registry. Uh, there's now a newer higher threshold to designate, to designate a property and we cannot designate a, a heritage property if a development proposal has been submitted. Uh, just in general, significant resources will be needed to complete the designation with t within two years, including costs, staffing, perhaps use of consulting time, and just generally and overall, there's a potential for the loss of herit cultural heritage resources. Uh, just highly quickly with respect to plans and subdivisions, uh, the requirement for public means is removed and this reduces the public's participation in the plan process with subdivisions. Uh, accessory units, as of right, permits for two additional units uh, within single, semi, and row house units. Uh, there may be a need for new, um, need for increased parking enforcement if parking over spills onto city streets. Maybe there will be a need to update planning documents and there may be potential servicing concerns with new accessory units being introduced into established neighborhoods. Uh, site plan control, uh, it's no longer applicable to residential development with 10 units or less. Uh, cannot be applied to exterior design features, like this character, scale, appearance, 
et cetera. You can perhaps uh, put a garbage bin in the front yard and we have limited control over that. Um, also, we cannot control the appearance of elements, facilities and works adjoining city roads. So there's no real opportunity to mitigate adverse impacts on streetscape or additional on streetscape or additional lands, for example, the waste bin disposal location. Uh, draining and grading issues will need to be addressed at the building permit stage. Uh, that we anticipate there may be increased uh, complaints, but the city will encourage developers to follow the city's uh, site plan guidelines that we're currently working on and will report back, report back to the province on any sort of negative impacts. Uh, parkland dedication at a high level. Uh, reduction in parkland dedication. There's a reduction in parkland de dedication in Cash and Lou. Uh, there will be a decreased um, parkland in denser neighborhoods of the provision of parkland. Uh, the owner or developer can now really identify the location of the parkland that will be uh, provided. And starting in 2023, the city must spend or allocate at least 60% of the cash and loop funds in the beginning of the year on an annual basis. So from an implication standpoint, uh, current parkland dedication bylaws and rates will need to be updated. Uh, the city must be forced to accept parkland that is not necessarily consistent with our parks master plan and is not situated and may not be situated in the best area to serve the neighborhood. If we refuse to accept it, this, uh, this can be potentially appealed and the city and can be potentially appealed to the OLT and we could lose and be <coughs> costs awarded against us. Uh, we'll need to develop a plan quickly to meet the 2023 targets and to spend the cash and loo funds. Uh, additional funds and resources may be needed to build parks faster, as well as there may be impacts on staffing and resources related to the design and construction of parks and due to the choice of parkland by developers and the change in the parkland rates. Uh, lastly, just with respect to the Ontario Land Tribunal, uh, the public, the Conservation Authority and the region have no right to appeal Planning Act decisions. Um, the OLT can dismiss appeals without a full hearing where the appellant has contributed undue delay or has failed to comply with a tribunal order. Uh, can, the OLT can award costs against an unsuccessful party. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor now has the authority to direct the OLT to prioritize the resolution of specified classes of proceedings. So perhaps if it was just with respect to affordable housing, those would go to the top of the uh, case pile. And the current appeals by the NBC, NPCA region and public will be dismissed unless the OLT has set a hearing date before October 25th, 2022. Um, just in general high level implications, the city may be subject to costs regarding appeals uh, just in general, there may be reduced public participation in the planning process, um, as well as there's prioritization of certain proceedings may result in delays of matters affecting the city. Uh, council decisions will need to be more sensitive and representative to residents and the public's concerns. And there just may be just general law reduce the incentive for good design and natural heritage protection. Thank you. This concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have questions, but I do have a comment and a motion. So if someone else has a question, I'd like to follow up yep. okay. after. Uh, do we have any questions uh, for Mr. Dick? Yes, uh, Councillor Strick. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Dick, thank you for the presentation. And I know it's kind of been shoved down our throats here from the, from the government. Um, could the, so the only people that can appeal now would be council or the developers. No one else could appeal. Sorry, microphone. I don't care. Sorry about that. So, so the, so only council or the developers would appeal. Would be would be the only ones to appeal. The public can appeal. Um, it's so it appears, but I do know that in the. Um, What's it called? Sorry, the standing committee today. They were thinking about making changes and perhaps comprehensive uh, OPs or OPAs may be subject to third-party appeals, but that's I think was what's been proposed. Okay. But I don't know exactly where that stands currently. And, and then I, I thought I saw I don't know if it was on this, but I remember reading on it. And and c can the minister over um, override any appeal as well? 
That's what I thought I saw. Um, I don't know the that exact down. exact answer, but I do okay. believe the and I'd love to hear if you have anything further. Mr. Burgess, has any further? We know this is still yeah. kind of evolving, yeah. but uh, do we know that at this point? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry I'm trying to stop you. I'm like, no, that's I okay. Uh, I do know the minister has some abilities um, in here, um, and I apologize. I did see it just a minute ago. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to. So he has the. I think what you're referring to is the minister uh, has decisions on official plans. Maybe not official plans amendment, but they they have that the ability to um, make changes <coughs> and amendments to official plans if they choose. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? No. Yes, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. It would appear that there's a lot of expenses here that are going to be paid for by the local taxpayer. Through the mayor uh, to the councillor. Um, so it appears, I do believe, I think, uh, Yes, it looks like it will be some cost will be transferred. And I do believe, I think, um, AMO, the Association of Ontario Municipalities, has identified potentially $5 billion collectively oops, across uh, the province. I find that very, very frustrating. Um, it's downloading, making it more difficult. <coughs> what I also find difficult with this study or uh, the bill 23 is there's nothing in there about homelessness it's all talking about housing but we need housing for the homeless and now that there's no development charges being collected we depended on the region for funding the homeless in our community. They can no longer collect development charges. And so it would appear that there's going to be a gross reduction in monies available to help us deal, help the region deal with homelessness in our community. Okay. Do we have any... Uh, Excuse me, Mayor, sorry, I'm not sure. Sorry, you're another rookie mistake. My apologies. <laughs> Um, maybe we can get some, uh, uh, resp I don't know if there's anybody that wants to respond between our CAO and our director and Mr. Dick. Yeah, Mr. CAO, you want to start off? Thank you. Through the chair to the counselor, I think, you know, your observation is not, uh, is not incorrect. I think this is a bit of a work in progress. Um, I think what this provincial government has done in the past has targeted specific funding for specific purposes. So, for example, the city got a uh, million dollars for a new software program to assist in the improvement and the speed of planning. Uh, what we're hoping uh, is that um, if municipalities hit certain targets, uh, they will get certain funding streams applied to them. So we're hoping that there will be this money taken away from development charges, but more funding opened up through other channels for specific targets. Um, and the homelessness issue and the uh, social housing issue, um, you know, I agree with you. I think, I think that's a top, top plate issue that needs to be dealt with. Um, there's a question of whether that should have been part of a development charge uh, or maybe it should be funded from uh, another source that's more stable. Um, so what I'm hoping for is that the pro provincial government looks for other funding sources that are better aligned with that need uh, because the worst case scenario, frankly, is you have a, is if you have a community that's not growing, they don't get development charges and communities that don't grow often have more homelessness issues. So therefore they need a better funding mechanism to deal with, uh, with those issues. So though it's not part of this legislation, I'm hopeful that there is other funding sources coming. And I think that's something that, um, you know, that we could, uh, push the provincial government for is for better funding sources for that uh, issue in particular. That point uh, yeah to that point Council yeah, Strange. Uh, is the province still going to be funding the region for homeless 
this? Like, I know they did in the past. It's just right? Yale. Yep, thank you. Um, yes, there, there are programs. Uh, there's a rate now at this point in time of the year because the provincial budget doesn't come out till March. Uh, there's a little uncertainty exactly what funding streams will be there. Um, but if you look at what's happened the last two years, and the city of Niagara Falls has been a big beneficiary, frankly, of some provincial funding, uh, both on Victoria Street uh, and the other project that Niagara Regional Housing did, that was substantially through provincial funding. Um, so we are hoping that those streams continue, uh, those uh, direct funding grants continue. So nothing is written right now. Um, I think the province is hearing this through their committees, quite frankly, that uh, a solution needs to be made for the affordable housing. Maybe DCs isn't the right method, but we hope that there is something there that's more permanent for the funding uh, for homelessness. Okay. You're, you're good, Councillor, and you're good. Uh is there anyone else before I know Councillor Lococo has got a, a motion she's going to bring forward? Any other questions? No? Looks like your good floor is yours, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> I've read a lot of our, I read our staff report, other cities' reports, and a lot of professional organizations. And since this report was posted, every day more and more organizations are posting their concerns about Bill 23 as it's presented. I'm very concerned. We're in a housing crisis, but I do not believe that Bill 23 as pre presented is the answer. I do not believe that it will, it, it will increase housing supply or address affordable housing. We will lose environmental protections, heritage conservation, good urban design and planning, and accountability to the public. The Association of Municipalities of Ontario did not have an opportunity to comment until after it was um, on its way to become um, um, a bill. In the past, growth paid for growth. If Bill 23 as presented is approved, growth and development will be on the back of taxpayers, our residents. Property taxes will increase. Each and every one of us will be paying for development as opposed to the developer. That is not right. People are having a rough time right now <coughs> keeping their houses. Interest rates are going up and we're coming into a recession. Some people say we are in a recession. I'd like to thank our staff for all of the, very, the, the work that they've done. It's a very detailed report, but I think council needs to send a stronger message. We are here to protect our residents and Bill 23 as presented does not do that. I've prepared a motion and have sent it to council ahead of time for their review. Uh, Mr. Clerk, do you have a copy of that that you could put up on the screen or I'll, I'll just read it? Mr. Clerk? Uh, through the mayor, I just have a printed copy, unfortunately. Okay, I'll, I don't I'll have read it on the screen. It. <coughs> so all of, st all, all of council does have this. Whereas Bill 23 as presented <coughs> fails to address the stated goals of increasing housing supply, housing affordability and improved process and instead will result in loss of environmental protections, heritage conservation, urban design and accountability to the public in order to, se in, in addition to severe financial implications for the city and the region as, as follows. Removing conservation of land and protection of significant environmental features, allowing development within protected areas worthy of protection. Limiting tools for observation of heritage resources. Removal of primary quality control mechanisms to promote good design. Loss of cohesive regional system oversight with the removal of the region of Niagara from review and approval of planning applications and the official plan creation. Elimination of appeal rights for the public on the Planning Act application and reduction in the overall public consultation and involvement. Transfer of financial responsibilities from private developers to the individual property taxpayer. If passed, it will undermine and reverse the progress that the city has made in the last couple of years in preparing and approving the city's housing strategy. And therefore, Niagara Falls City Council is opposed to Bill 23 as it stands and requests the province to defer the passage of Bill 23 until <coughs> such time as further evaluation, analysis, and meaningful public consultation has occurred with residents and the municipalities, AMO, which is the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, the Niagara Region, ROMA, RPC, NPCA, Conservation Ontario, OPPI, MFOA, and OBCM 
and therefore council strongly recommends that substantial provincial investment be provided to support the municipalities to fund anticipated infrastructure upgrades to accommodate new intensification goals and compensate for decrease of development charge funding opportunities as outlined in the proposed legislation and therefore that council authorize staff to provide the comments to the environmental registry of ontario regarding proposed bill 23 prior to november 24th and therefore that council receive report pbd 2022-73 the report that staff has just put forward for information and that staff forward the report to the premier the minister of municipal housing uh, affairs and housing region of niagara and its local municipalities and local member of provincial parliament so that is my motion and i'm requesting a, a recorded vote please I would say that. Okay, thank you for that uh, so we've got a motion by councillor lococo seconded by councillor campbell and everybody did receive this yesterday or this morning we received it so hopefully everyone's had a chance to read it through so do we have any questions or some comments on it? Yes, uh, Councillor Strange. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I just see, so I'm, I'm looking at um, Councillor Lococo's motion and there's actually a motion, the exact same motion on 11.7. So is this a St. Catherine's motion or is this your motion or it's the exact same wording, I don't know. Some of it is from St. Catherine, some of it is my own and some of it's from other places. It is a combination, the, the well, first it's, like it's eight, the exact, it's eight, exact eight same. F. It's the exact same. A to F is, G is changed. Okay. And the last two parts are changed. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Councillor Strange, did you have any other no, comments? No, I'm, I'm just, I just wanna speak a little bit, you know, and I don't wanna, uh, and I, I realize that uh, the, the province was kind of jammed us down its throat, and I think it's going in a couple days um, to pass, and, we're, we're in this position and, and they have to have 1.5 million homes in the next 10 years. And we do realize that the feds have, uh, they're putting extra pressure because the, their immigration, they're having 1.5 million or 1.6 million immigrants in the next three years are coming into Canada, which is great, but we need homes for, for them as well. I know we did a lot of canvas and I'm sure uh, uh, all the councillors did and uh, um, everyone I talked to was talking about affordable housing and, and everyone probably had it on their, on their uh, uh, you know, basically importance of what we wanna do this council term is affordable housing, um, especially when you talk to parents and they said, you know, our kids can't afford houses anymore. It's crazy, how are they gonna afford it in the future? And this is a good answer to it. It's not perfect, obviously, but it is a solution. And you know, you, you get something that's, and they're all coming to Toronto, uh, immigration-wise. Um, we need these homes, and it's, it's it's a simple supply and demand. We have lots of supply; the prices are, are going to go down, and that was the problem in the last couple of years. You've seen, you know, bungalows, <coughs> uh, you know, uh, 1,100 square foot bungalows for 950,000, and now you look at them, and they're they're further down because of the mortgage rates have gone up. They're down 20 percent, but if there's a way that we need to get housing, this looks like the way. It's not perfect, um, but like I think uh, the CEO said uh, earlier when we're in, a, we're in a meeting, it says, you know, you can either ride with the train or you can get rode over by it, so. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor uh, Neustag? I agree. Um, during campaigning, that was the one thing we heard repeatedly was affordable housing, uh, to Mike's point. Um, everybody talked about it, they're very, very concerned. Um, my concern right now is that the province, although this bill does have a lot of concerns, and I think uh, staff has definitely outlined it, um, at least it's a start where there's something in place to, to get us moving. Um, my recommendation is to support, or I'd like to put a motion to support the staff recommendation for their report. I find it extremely detailed, it's critical, so they have a, um, touched on many things, and perhaps with those um, items that they've been speaking about, that maybe they can go to ask for um, a meeting with the Minister of um, Ministry Affairs and Housing so that we can start moving forward and addressing this affordable housing rather than going back and just stopping everything um, and, but, and then work together <coughs> to find more solutions. Anyway, I'd like to put in motion that um, our staff um, have put a lot of time, it's very detailed, it's very thorough, and we look at that um, 
more carefully. So Sorry. what we have to do, so we're dealing with one motion right now. We've got a motion on the floor that Councilor Lococo and Campbell put forward. <clears throat> Depending on how that turns out, you could there could be another opportunity for a different motion. Okay, So Sorry. So we'll deal with this one for now. So no, I appreciate that. Uh, good comments, I appreciate that. And, and it's good, we get dialogue from everybody. So everybody's input. So if we've got some other input around, so right now we're dealing with specifically the motion that Council Lococo put out, the one that she just read. So that's, we'll direct our comments mostly toward that right now. So do we have some other feedback or insight from Council? Okay, all right, then we're gonna call the vote if there's no further, uh, dis yes, Councilor Thompson? <clears throat> yeah, I don't uh, get upset <clears throat> about uh, the region not getting involved in our development in our uh, municipality and uh, you know wetlands are the big issue here and uh, I think that's with the conservation um, people they um, fly, fly over the city and they take picture and they uh, say wetlands and they prevent them from being developed and I think that's um, sad and the person who owns that um, they have to go through a, a whole year of uh, environmental uh, studies and holds everything up with the housing and development. So um, I would like to support this and uh, make sure um, um, we uh, see what the province is going to go in the final uh, time with this issue. Okay, thank you for that, Council. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments before we call the vote on, on the motion presented? Okay, so there's been a request for a recorded vote, Mr. Clerk. <clears throat> So I think everyone has heard the motion and what I'll do is I'll just read off the councillors' names one at a time and you can respond by saying in favor or opposed. Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Baldinelli. In favor. Councillor Neustag. In favor. Councillor Patel. In favor. Councillor Lococo. In favor. Councillor Strange. Councillor Thompson? No. And Mayor Diodati? I'm opposed. Okay, that motion carries. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so next, uh, what's next? So are we done dealing with this at this point? Bill 23? Just wanna make sure, are we, Ms. Dolch, are we done? Is that it for this at this point on that, yeah? Hey. What's that? Okay. 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 Moving on to the consent agenda. Oh, do we so got a call back, Councillor Peter Peter Angelo? So move. Okay. Hold on consent. one second. There he is. Okay. So we're now uh, welcome back, Councillor Peter Angelo. We're now on the uh, consent agenda. Uh, there are four uh, items, and there's a motion by Councillor Thompson to receive the consent agenda. Uh, looking for a second to uh, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Okay, we're on to item 10, communications and comments of the city clerk. Now, Mr. Clerk, did you want to walk us uh, through the uh, recommendation? Yeah, I, uh, much like the mayor's reports, there's been a lot of time that has passed, so therefore there's a lot of communications on tonight's agenda. 
what we've tried to do is we've tried to lump them all together mm. into different sections uh, so that council has the opportunity to approve them all uh, in one motion as was just done with the consent agenda. But of course, if there's anything that uh, any councillor would like lifted, uh, we could do that. So we'll start with uh, section 10, communications of the city clerk. It's a recommendation that council approves or supports items 10.1 through to 10.8. Okay, so, yep, motion by Councillor Thompson. Well, yeah, okay. Oh yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, Councillor Peter Angelo. Oh. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, 10.8, the downtown BIA, the 2023 budget, did, did we pull this one? Did we deal with this one at all? No. We're on 10, right? Yeah. I know we had a couple emails saying that the AGM is coming up on November 24th. Um, and they've asked us to, you know, wait until after uh, the new appointments, if there are any, um, and they were going to discuss their budget at the AGM as well. I, I don't mind waiting, Your Worship, until the next meeting. Um, perhaps I'll make that motion just that we defer it until the December meeting, uh, and then it can come back to us then. And if there's any changes, perhaps the BIA can let us know before the December meeting. Okay. Okay. Motion by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Neustag. Do we have any discussion to that motion? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Yeah. Okay, uh, opposed? Okay, all right, so that's approved. Do you need a motion for the balance? Uh, yes, we do. I'll, so move oh, yours. Motion by Councilor Peter Angel. Sec, pardon me? No, I thought I. Oh, he, if his hand was up first, Your Worship, yeah. he can Oh, move it. for the rest, right? Okay. Yeah. Motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angelo, that we approve the rest of the communications. And I'm going to read them just before I call the vote. I'm sorry, yes? Okay, uh, right. With a conflict from uh, Councillor Baldinelli, you're fine. You stay there because I'm just going to quickly read them all. So um, let me just go back here. <coughs> we're just dealing with Section 10. Pardon me? Yeah, we're just dealing with Section 10. Right. So I'm just gonna really, so they're flag raising here, um, November 28th uh, for Positive Living Niagara and AIDS Awareness Week, flag raising for Dominican Republic Restoration Day, which will be August 19th of 2023, flag raising for Romania's National Day in Niagara for December 2nd, um, special occasion permit request for the Tequila Expo uh, which will take place at the Convention Center December the 3rd. And then there's some planning memos. So that makes up the, the uh, things that we're about to approve. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. With one noted conflict from Councillor uh, Baldinelli. Okay, moving on to item 11. Um, so we only have one item. Is that right? No, no, we have more than one. I'm sorry. Mr. Clerk, did you want to walk us through this one? Uh, yes, so that the way that recommendation in section 11 should read is that council receive and file for information items 11.1 .1 through to and including 11.13. If there's anything that uh, a council would like pulled from that list, otherwise uh, one motion would be to receive all of those correspondence for information. Does anyone want anything lifted? out of the um, communications and comments of the city clerk. And if not, we'll do them in mass from 11.1 .1 to 11.13. So we're looking for a motion then? I'll move it. I mean, I do have some conflicts on some of them, but if they become a discussion, I'll just walk out. We'll record them, yeah. Okay. So motion by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Strange, uh, that we uh, approve communication items 11.1 .1 through 11.13. And this is uh, correspondence that we've received. Okay, and we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, okay, we're gonna take a pause for one second. The CAO, do you need us to? No, no. Oh. So,
Okay, Council, just to bring it where it was brought to our attention, maybe procedurally we did something that we didn't follow our own procedural bylaw. The motion brought forward by Council Lococo, um, we didn't give notice of motion. And to do that, to bypass, and, and for the new councillors, you have to give notice before you present something new that's not on the agenda. So in that case, you do one of two things. Either you give notice or you get it waived. And to get it waived, uh, you need to, is it two thirds uh, of council, Mr. Clerk? Correct. So we're gonna now have a uh, caucus of our solicitor, our clerk and our CAO. So we're gonna take a five minute recess. Well, they're gonna go and caucus and discuss, ask everyone just to remain in the room. Uh, will they discuss what we would do next in this point? Yes, Councillor Lococo. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the only reason why I brought it forward this way was because it was part of that report and those two recommendations are in my motion. So I didn't put a no notice of motion forward because it was it, it had something to do with this. If it was notice of motion, then it would have went on the next agenda. So that's why I didn't do it. It was specifically about this on the agenda with the two recommendations. They're in my motion. Okay. Just and and again, I, I'm not yep. the procedural expert, but we're going to get legal opinion on this one so we go about it the right way. And administratively, I just want to point out if we could have the WeStream cameras continue to roll. Uh, if, if you need to put a graphic on the screen that we're in recess, that's fine, but please leave the cameras rolling for the sake of uh, any ombudsman complaints. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah. Just some Christmas music. Yeah, some Christmas music. Maestro. That would be fine.
Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Through the chair, um, apologize, but um, this is our first council meeting of the of the new uh, of the new session. So you know, a little uh, might be a little rusty on a few things. And uh, our clerk was dealing with a uh, injury uh, at the same time this came up. So um, we identified um, a potential procedural error. Staff went uh, to caucus. Um, I'll, I'll let the clerk. Um, I'll let the clerk describe it. So we do apologize um, uh, for the for the delay in staff getting back to uh, to council on this, but we believe that we have uh, a solid plan forward. And the rationale, the key rationale, I just want to remember to remind all of council, the reason we have notices of motion or the reasons we produce our reports uh, before council meeting is that it allows the public to provide comment to councillors on what's going to be discussed uh, if they if they so choose. So that's why the important about transparency and notice is always important. Um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't mean that council can't deal with something. That's why we also have the waiver of the uh, of the uh, procedural bylaw. But that waiver is to remind council that you're doing something without actually notifying the public of what's being debated. And it is, a f it is something that we're trying to stress here to ensure that we are transparent to, uh, to the public on, on matters we discuss. So we did trip up a little bit. We apologize as, as staff. We should have caught that uh, a little earlier. Um, so we do apologize for that, but uh, the clerk will walk through that and give uh, council some options to consider. Th thank you. Yeah, Councillor, yes? So if someone wants to do a, a, a motion a notice of motion, and it was made two nights ago. It would come to council today, and then it would go on next council meeting. Is that the, the right procedure? Why don't we get that? We'll hear that from our clerk. Just so okay. everyone knows, including the new councilors. Yeah, so just to echo the CEO's comments uh, procedurally, uh, it, it it should have been uh, recognized as a notice of motion. Of, as Councillor Strange just pointed out, notice of motion wouldn't be able to actually be put on the agenda until the next meeting. I realized that uh, Councillor Lococo had some urgency with her request, uh, of course, because the province is only taking uh, comments from agencies, municipalities, etc., until November 24th. So we wouldn't have that, uh, that uh, ability to just put this on to the next meeting and still, still deal with it. Uh, regardless, what should have uh, taken place procedurally is we should have dealt with the staff recommendation that was in the report, since that is the recommendation that was circulated publicly and what the, com what the public was expecting us, uh, expecting council to, to consider. Uh, what we could do uh, now is uh, we could go through and ask for a motion to suspend the rules or a motion to waive the procedural bylaw to allow for this uh, was essentially a notice of motion. Mr. Clerk? Yes. Uh, yes. Question. You have a I'm, conflict? I'm a little lost. Like, which one are we on? Yeah, you know what? So, we're, yeah, you might want to leave. Yeah, sorry about that. We should have mentioned that. <coughs> sorry. Sorry. Yeah, that's not lost. If you were here, you would have corrected it all. <laughs> you would have caught it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Sorry, Mr. Clerk. No, that's okay. Uh, it's a good point because we should have probably just prefaced this by saying we're jumping back on the agenda to section uh, 811 under reports, and this was dealing with the planning report uh, on Bill 23, the More Homes for Everyone Act. Uh, so I realize we were at section 12 on the agenda. We're jumping back to section 811. Uh, again, so in order to get the... Uh, uh, motion to suspend the rules, which is what would have allowed uh, this notice of motion to be t dealt with this evening as opposed to next meeting. Uh, that does require a two-thirds majority uh, of council to pass. And the CEO can correct me if, if my uh, thought process is incorrect here, but I think that's what we would do now is we would ask for uh, that motion to suspend the rules to allow for uh, the Councillor Lococo's notice of motion to be dealt with on tonight's agenda as opposed to waiting until next meeting. So moved. Okay, so we have a 
Okay, so we have a motion by Councilor Campbell, seconded by Councilor Loco, Lococo to, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, to waive, I'm sorry, to waive the procedural bylaw is that, uh, on for her motion. Correct. Is that right? Okay. So we have a motion by Councilor Campbell, second by Councilor Lococo. Two thirds. And we need two thirds majority? Yes. Okay. Recorded right. vote, please. Okay, recorded vote, Mr. Clerk. I don't we do this anyway. Pardon me? I don't. I, what, well, we cancel, have to do. Cancel it? Yeah, well. This right now, the, the motion on the floor would be just to allow for that notice of motion, uh, which is essentially waiving the procedural bylaw. It's called a motion to suspend the rules, uh, since there wouldn't be an opportunity to just bring this forward at the next council meeting. That does require a two thirds majority. It's in the council's procedural bylaw. And if it doesn't achieve two thirds, how many do we need then? There's how many do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, you five. need six. Uh, five, five out of eight is 62.5%. Uh, okay. So we would need, yeah, we would need uh, six. Okay, so the motion again is to uh, suspend the rules of the procedural bylaw. Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Baldinelli. In favor. Uh, Councillor Neustag. Not in favor. Councillor Patel. Not in favor. Councillor Lococo. In favor. And Councillor Peter Angel has a conflict. Councillor Strange? Yes. Councillor Thompson? No. And Mayor Diodati? I'm opposed. Uh, so that is, uh, has five opposed. It does not meet the uh, two thirds requirements. So what happens now? Uh, essentially what that means is we didn't have the, uh, the right to entertain a notice of motion. Uh, or sorry, a no we didn't have the right to entertain the suspension of rules and notice of motion. So, this, um, so I think we go back to the original staff recommendation. Councilor Coco uh, can then, we can debate that, uh, put it on the floor, have a first, or in, first and seconder to put it on the floor do the normal debate and if there are amendments that councillors want to that report then you can deal with amendments in normal procedural order uh, because some of councillor coco's um, items were amendments to uh, the motion so so we can deal with that on an individual basis going forward at that point in time or you can defeat uh, like any other uh, staff report you can also defeat it and and move on but it just sets you back to normal now or to the first step okay so councillor coco Thank you, Mr. Well, you Mayor. We have to get a first and seconder for the staff recommendation for the staff report because we never got a first and seconder for the staff report. You're right. You're right. We didn't. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't mean to put anybody on the spot, but this was the um, order that things happened. On Monday, I spoke with the clerk and I told him um, that I, I was, wanted to put a motion. He did bring up a notice of motion and I said it was for an existing item on the agenda. I told him which one. So it wasn't a new one. I know we've always done notice of motions for new motions. This was something that was already on the agenda. Um, he, he suggested, um, as I said, that I could send it to everybody. He said, yes, that would be a good opportunity for everybody to see it beforehand. So I did send it last night, so everybody had it from last night, whether you read it last night or got it this morning. We've had all of today that there could have been um, some notice to me that something was not right with it or that we needed to do something else. Um, we could have talked about it as it was happening. That didn't happen. Um, my question is, are there anything in the policies that says you, should ex you will exclude a motion if a, motion, a notice of motion is not brought? Is there anything in our policies that you that says it will exclude it? I'll ask staff to whoever wants to address that. Well, I'll start, and <clears throat> I, th I think the challenge with this one is because it's attended to a, an initial report, you can enter those items in as amendments to the staff report or uh, another item. We never debated the actual report that went out to public. That's the challenge with this. If we would have put <clears throat> the report 
if we would have accepted the report first, we, the problem is we never put that report on the table. You put a motion on the table in front of the staff report, which was publicly circulated. So that report should have either been defeated or amended. Uh, that's the challenge with the process that happened. So um, I, I think that would have been the better, like we should have accepted the staff report uh, or defeated the staff report or made amendments to the staff report. And then if we wanted a completely different direction, then you ask for the suspension uh, of it. The challenge was we kind of went out of order uh, based upon what was there. So if someone would have made a motion to accept and second of the staff report, and then during the debate, you would have put those amendments on the table then that would have been part of the appropriate procedure, but we kind of missed the step of putting the original report on the table. So it's not that your motions that you've pre-circulated are dead at this point in time. You can just enter those as part of the debate on the report and council can accept or defeat those on an individual type of basis. Okay, thank you. I do understand that and procedure got a little messed up there. Um, it's hard for me to understand when we've waived other motions, whether we knew what they were, we just waived them, we would move forward with them. This was passed, it was five to three. It got passed, there was no mention of a, a, a weird procedure, and now no, the, the motion to, of the two thirds to bring it back is a no. So it, it seems that it's the content of the motion and not necessarily the procedure, because we've all messed up on this, not just one person, we're all in the same boat, and now it's, that the motion is now defeated to not bring it back. So if, if the process is that I'll bring it as an amendment to the motion, we'll see where that goes, but that this motion was already passed. Yeah, and I'll let the clerk do it. I know I was, I was a little slow in the uptake, and I'll be honest with you, because I had to go and reconfirm whether the original report got put to the table. And that's when I confirmed that the original report wasn't put to the table. The, the, the issue then becomes that's a whole new, um, that's a whole new motion that you've put on there because the original report was never even tabled. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I do, the challenge with it is if we did go through it and if someone else from the public said you didn't follow procedural order, then we're exposed on that front. So the two thirds was a way to either bring it in line to the, and to be honest with you, the original vote I believe did not attain two thirds either. Uh, so it didn't pass by a two-thirds motion. That's the one thing we went back to check uh, of staff because if your motion would have passed by two-thirds, we probably would have said, well, it was accepted either way. Um, so we just want to make sure it's clean because then if we are submitting something to the province, we want to make sure that the proper procedures were followed. Uh, we don't want the recommendation or anything going to the province where someone can question whether it was passed um, correctly. So I think, you know, we, and you know, I, I'm, a, I'm an old football referee and they always used to say, it doesn't matter how ugly it is, just get the call right. Um, and I think we just want to make sure we get the call right on this one. And, and I think we're just trying to do the best procedurally we can. So we do apologize. Councillor, we should have provided better guidance to you prior to, um, you know, prior to you standing up. We should have said, let's either pass the motion or, or do a notice of motion. And, and that's staff's, that staff's fault. We'll take, we'll take the blame for that. Okay, thank you. And again, as our clerk said, the notice of motion wouldn't be um, um, time effective because the, the date yes. is, is two days from now, so it wouldn't apply for, for um, next time. Um, and I did state that the two recommendations that are in the report are in my motion. So they, they are in there. And again, I can't understand why we would not approve it to allow what happened a few minutes earlier. So to me, it's the content and it's not the procedure. Mr. Clerk? I think it just, it's worth noting that uh, Councilor Lococo, you didn't do anything incorrectly. Uh, it was a procedural matter up at the front here uh, that should have been caught. And I think the key point there is what was discussed earlier is that the, the motion that you brought forward, the public hasn't had a chance to review that and comment. There, there could have been uh, comments on both sides where uh, procedurally uh, someone could contact the clerk's office within 24 hours of the meeting and ask to speak to the matter. Uh, so by, them, by the public not seeing your motion ahead of time, it was great that council had an opportunity to see it, but the public did not. So we just wanna make sure that procedurally we have this corrected. 
Thank you. I, I do appreciate that. And just a couple of meetings ago, we had motions on the table that we waived. Public didn't have an opportunity to, to do that. And I know this is a new term. We're trying to do better. It just doesn't make sense to me why someone would vote a certain way and then vote not to allow it, the vote to stand. So um, what does this mean? Do I have to remove this or it never happened? Or can I put, put the motion forward to amend the staff report with my list that was in the notice of motion? Well, Mr. Clerk? We're gonna go back now and deal with the recommendation that's in the staff report. We'll let that, that play out. Uh, you have every opportunity at that point to make friendly amendments to that motion. Um, and that procedurally, uh, that may be the best way to deal with this since the uh, uh, motion for waiving the procedural bylaw was defeated. Okay, thank you. Then I will put the motion forward to accept the uh, 8.11, the staff report, with the friendly amendments that were in my motion. Okay, so which are we talking about? The lettered ones, Councillor Lococo, the uh, A to G? Well, A to G is the, the preamble, it's the therefores, and the, the one therefore is the two recommendations that are in, in the report. So it's, uh, therefore Niagara Falls City Council is opposed to Bill 23 as it stands and requests the province, that paragraph. Therefore, Council strongly recommends substantial provincial investment, that paragraph. And then, therefore, Council authorized staff to provide comments to the Environmental Registry of Ontario that paragraph and then the last paragraph says to receive the the report and staff forward the report and there's one I think um, government body or two government bodies that are added to that that was in the report okay so we've got four um, suggested amendments to the report so mr. clerk now should we vote on them individually or collectively or what how what's the best way to go about doing this uh, I think voting on them individually is a great idea. And if we want, we could read them off uh, one at a time. Okay, yes, uh, Councillor Newsteg, I'm sorry. Okay, I know. Okay, we, we, we got to kind of regroup a little bit and explain. So, Councillor Lococo, what she, she's going to try to do now is she made a motion, seconded by Councillor Campbell, that they're moving the report, uh, report... 2022-73, but she's making proposed amendments, and I don't even know if it's possible to get them on the screen or if people have printed copies of the amendments, but there are four um, amendments. So in the email she sent to us at the very end, there were four therefores. So what we'll do, we're gonna go through each one individually and vote just on, are we gonna vote on the amendments first? Is that the best way? I mean, that's how we do it at the region. We vote on the amendment, then we vote on the full motion kind of thing with the amendments. So would that be a good way of, because um, otherwise you're gonna kill the motion, the staff motion without, do you? you don't vote on the motion first and then add amendments to it? So no, so what we would do is, so now an amendment's been made, so we would vote on the amendments one at a time, there's four of them, and then, whatever ones make it, then they get added to the motion, and then we vote on the motion with the approved amendments. Is that right, Mr. Clerk, do I have that? Yep. That's how we do it at the region as well. So, and then people do amendments to amendments, so before you know it, the, 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 it gets very confusing at points, so we'll see, so. Did you wanna say something, Councillor? That I wanted a recorded vote for the For, the for each one. of the four. Yes, please. Yeah, so Mr. Clerk, uh, and then maybe we'll reach, so I'll read. Which one? The, the staff one, because that's the first part, and then you have to do the amendment. Okay. Okay. So the first, the recommendation is that council receive this report for information. That a copy of this report be sent to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Region of Niagara, and its local area municipalities. So that's the first recommendation. No, you see, that's a staff recommendation. Now you're recommending. Do we vote on that one? No. no you just, you okay. Just so that council knows what the first staff. Recommendation so the first, so that's the staff recommendation. Now the first recommendation from Councilor Lococo. Therefore, Niagara Falls City Council is opposed to Bill 23 as it stands and requests the province defer passage of Bill 23 until such time as further evaluation, analysis, 
and meaningful public consultation has occurred with residents and municipalities, AMO, Niagara Region, Roma, RPC, NPCA, Conservation Ontario, OPPI, MFOA, and OBCM. So that's the first one. Did, did, does everyone, or does anyone need me to read it again? Or does everyone understand? So we're gonna vote on each one individually. There's four of them, okay? Is everybody, because I'll go as slow as you need me to go, if anyone's not following along. This is not a typical evening for the new people, so this, we're a little bit off, you know, I don't want you to get all, so, so don't feel bad if you're don't, not following along, just tell me. So we're gonna vote on, basically, therefore, the first therefore, Niagara Falls is opposed to Bill 23 as it stands. So that's basically what the first one is. Okay, Mr. Clerk, whenever you're ready. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Therefore, Niagara Falls City Council is opposed to Bill 23 as it stands and requests province defer passage. That's basically it. So you're basically saying you're against the, the Bill 23. Councillor Baldinelli. Oh, we have a question. Yes. So we can't speak to this. We can just vote. Uh, Is it? No, they can speak to this. You can speak. Do you have a do you have questions or comments? Yes, you can speak. Because I think it's a very um, broad microphone. Topic, so. Oh, micro microphone. Yes, I think it's a very broad question. So, um, being opposed to it is saying that we're if we vote against being opposed to it, that means we're totally in favor of it. it doesn't mean that we're totally in favor of it, and I don't even think the staff. Um, report says that they're totally in favor no. of it. There's a lot of questions here. So I'm finding it very, and this whole thing's very much a, it's one or the other. Yes. And that's where I'm having trouble with it. Because when, again, you're out campaigning and everyone's talking about housing affordability, um, just having a, a, a complete yes or no doesn't help us. If we can come together and work together and try and piece together things, that makes more sense than just a definitive no. So saying we're totally opposed to build, um, uh, 23 doesn't give us discussion. There are some things that we need to look at, but many things in staff reports said that they had concerns about too. So I think it's, um, th it's there's a lot of, uh, it should be more gray than black and white on this. So I'll just throw a suggestion out there, depending on how everything plays out, you can also add amendments. So this isn't the end of the line. So anybody in this chamber, any of the councillors here, you can also propose amendments and we'll vote on. So if you've got something you want to add on, so the first one's the staff recommendation that we receive this and that we send a copy of the, our report to the ministry in the region and the local area municipalities. And <coughs> Council Lacoco is making four uh, suggested amendments. Council Newstate, you can also add something too that addresses what you're saying. So like you can still be in favor, but have parts you don't agree with, right? Like, so I know exactly what you're saying. It's not all, but we're, be, we're kind of deciding we're out or we're in right now. And you're saying you're you're in, but some things you don't like. And I know exactly what you're saying. But that's what the staff report's saying. There's many things yes. in here that they're saying they don't like. They have great concerns about, and they've spent a lot of time um, putting it together. And they've highlighted the the things that are not good yes. for our residents. Um, you're right. But we need to start moving forward. So at least if we we have a discussion here that we can say there's a lot of concerns we have: the development charges, the environment, the heritage. But at least put us to the table and meet with the minister to say these are our concerns. Staff has put a lot of time into this, but just to um, it, eliminate it and to say we're against it, we've gone nowhere. Like we're back to nowhere, and the whole crisis is this housing affordability. So maybe, uh, if that's the case, you may want to add, you were mentioning something earlier about having the minister or the ministry uh, address our concerns. Maybe that'll be one of your, uh, you may add one of those amendments as well that we can vote on. Okay. So that's possible as well. All right. So it's good, valid points. Yes, Councillor, I've got Councillor Coco and then Councillor Patel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The reasons why a lot of municipalities are doing this is because um, Premier Ford, I'm just going to use numbers, say Premier Ford put 100, um, uh, points forward about you have to do all of these things guidelines rules wh whatever um, a lot of people don't like 50 of them and they like 50 of them so I can understand what Councillor Newestig says is we, we need to start somewhere when you negotiate you always start up high and you negotiate low what Premier Ford has done is he's put all of this stuff out and if people accept them he's going to get a hundred of those those um, items everyone is going to follow them. If municipalities stand up and say this is not acceptable, he's going to 
reduce it from the 100 down to something else that is more manageable. So that's why a lot of municipalities are standing up and saying no. Sure, there's some good things in it, there's some bad things too, but there's a lot of bad things that will really affect our residents. The, their, um, the, their tax rate, um, the, the bills that they get from the city, so that's why municipalities are saying no, because it was a whole bill. It was a yes or a no, and a lot of times we can't do yes or a no. You can't agree with everything, but it's taking a stand against the provincial government for putting this whole package together, and if we don't stand up, we're going to get all 100, like I'm saying, just that number, we'll get all 100, 100 recommendations. So that's that's why a lot of municipalities are doing this. And it, the, in, in that um, number one, it says, um, to oppose Bill 23 as it stands and request the pr province defer the passage until such time further evaluation, analysis, and meaningful public consultation has occurred with the residents and the municipalities. So bringing the minister in, th that's that con consultation. So it's not just, oh, throw it all out and stop talking. It's the premier put so many things forward, a lot of them um, a lot of people don't like and will be very detrimental financially, economically, environmentally um, to us. So if you don't stand up, you're going to get them all. The only thing I would suggest to that is that first line says we're opposed to it. It's, so we're not saying there's good things in it. We're just saying we're opposed to it. And I think what you just said is there's some good things and there's some not so good things. So the only problem with that is it takes a stand we're opposed, right? So Yes, I completely understand what you're saying, but it's here's the whole bill. And, and there's been no opportunity to, to discuss it. So it's either a yes or a no. So that's why I put in the oppose with the preamble of let's have some discussion and changes in analysis. Maybe if it said we're concerned, maybe it would have been, but now it's forcing people to pick a side, you know? So I'm gonna, I'm coming on this side. I've got uh, Councillor Patel and then Councillor Strange. I'm still kind of confused on this because the bill they're proposing, Bill 23, has pros and cons. I do agree with them that we do need more housing. There was a number one issue during the election. And mm -hmm. I do like the part where they say that lower tier government gets more control over what they do in their municipality. Mm -hmm. And we should be looking forward to reducing a layer that duplicates government forms. But that's, I do agree with that. But I, other way, they are expecting our taxpayer resident to bear the, uh, the cost of the development. Mm -hmm. So I am opposed to that. But when we say we are opposing Bill 23, we are stopping the conversation. We have to keep the conversation going. We have very capable staff, and they have great recommendation. I think staff, our council, Mr. Mayor, we all should work together and continue to keep the conversation going, talk to the minister's office, and let's see where we get. Because we just cannot stop the conversation. We have to keep it going. Okay, for a comment, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Strange. Yeah, Mayor, and I don't want to let the government know that we're opposed. Of course, we want changes, but it comes down again to, you know, can our next generation afford a house right now? No, your children can't afford a house right now because there's not enough supply. They're offering this. They're offering the supply. The prices are going to go down and make it more affordable for everybody. So our children and grandchildren can be able to afford a house. That's what has to happen in the future. So if we go out and say we're opposed to to Bill 23, that just, like you said, that just stops the talking right there. If you want to do amendments, I'm fine with that, but to, to say we're opposed to 23, I can't be agreeing with. Mr. Mayor, I'll change the word from opposed to concerned and keep all of the stuff that was in there as it stands and request the province to defer the passage until such further evaluation, the exact same thing, put concerned and take opposed if that's the word that's problematic. What's, I think that would definitely help so, um, Okay, so let me read this again, and then Mr. Craig, you're, you're, you're ready on your end, right? Well, if Let's go. there's a reminder, if she changes the word, you have to get a second to confirm that he's going to continue to second. Oh, yeah. So uh, will the second or continue to second if it's defer versus opposed? Absolutely. Okay. The answer is yes. Okay. Move in the second or good? Okay. So I'm going to read it to you again. There, and then it's going to be a recorded vote, so we're going to go in the same order. It's alphabetical. Okay, and then there's going to be four of these from Councilor Lococo. Plus, if, if Councilor Neustag or anyone else wants to make another amendment, we can add something else as well and vote on it. Therefore, Niagara Falls City Council is concerned about Bill 23 as it stands and requests the province defer passage of Bill 23. 
until such time as further evaluation, analysis, and meaningful public consultation, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we're all set, Mr. Uh, Mr. Clerk. Okay. Um, let's start with. Uh, Sorry, the microphone, please. Thank you. <laughs> let's start with Councilor Baldinelli. Agree. That was agree. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Campbell. In favor. Uh, next, we'll then go with Councilor Lococo. In favor. Councilor Patel. Sorry, Councilor Newestag, alphabetically. I think I'm, in I, I'm still kind you of. You want to clarify? Yeah, I, but I want to understand what defer means. Like, okay. You know, I, no, I know what defer means. Like, yeah. What does that mean in the whole thing? Like, does mm -hmm. defer mean that it's off the table? It's like, well, when I we ask the, the essence of where I. The essence of what I'm trying to get at is that we've got to keep this whole conversation going. Does defer mean, like, and I agree, Laurie, there is a lot of concerns here, and, and we have them, and I think we're saying the same thing, but we just don't want to end it with a standstill. We've got to keep this whole thing going. Um, maybe, uh, you know, they're just, like you were saying before, they've just, the government's come in very strong, and then we need people to um, have consultations and bring it back so we end up more in a, a center position. I think we're saying the same thing, but um, defer, does that mean that it just keeps getting, um, how like how long does that delay go on without having um, addressing this affordable housing so why we're all in you know talking around like this people aren't ending up with houses and that's my major concern because it was so loud and clear when we we're um, canvassing that people are so so concerned about affordable housing so if we can't get it together then you know it's not helping them so what does defer mean I yeah if we can so maybe you can um, and if I could just throw oh. one other idea just before uh, Councillor Coco, maybe what if defer is removed and you leave all the rest that, so basically you're not telling them what to do, you're saying we're concerned about it and there needs to be further discussion, blah, 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 rather than telling them what to do and saying defer it. Maybe just, I, I think maybe that might be what gets some people on side, just throw that out there. Thank you for the suggestion, Mr. Mayor, and I appreciate your comments, um, Councillor Newestig. We are all on the same page. What is going to happen is if the provincial government doesn't hear from municipalities, they're just going to go through and do what they want. Um, so the word defer, I don't have a one month, two month, three month. It's supposed to come back in March. If enough municipalities say that they have concerns about it and hold off on it, then hopefully they will do something. The provincial government can do what they want. Ho hopefully enough, enough municipalities will have a, a challenge with this and express concern. But if they just say, oh yeah, we're concerned, go ahead and do what you want, it's not strong enough. And that was in my preamble that I think we need to set a, a strong <coughs> tone for this to, to say that yes, we are really concerned financially um, for our, our residents, economically, for, for the, the city, environmentally for our, our residents for housing. Um, if you don't take a strong stance, they're not going to do it, they're not going to change anything. They're just going to file everything under G. So that's why I put in defer, and again, um, I, I've, I've done a lot of homework on different municipalities about what they're doing, and the, the strong stance is defer. They might say no, but at least they understand that we want to defer <coughs> what they're talking about now and start conversations and analysis and, and consultations. We're not saying, and, and the other comment that was made was, if we oppose it or defer it, the government can't not give us money. If we meet those targets, as um, Ms. Dolch was talking about, if we meet those targets and those deadlines, we're going to get the money. The government's not going to stop giving us money just because we said we don't like it. So I, I wanna put that out there. Thank you for that. Councillor Strange? Just to the point, they said, is it supposed to come back in March or when is this supposed to be going to Toronto and, and passing? Do we know when Does this anybody, becomes law, um, Ms. Dolch? Does any have any idea? Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to the Councillor, uh, no, we don't know yet exactly when it's going to be approved. Obviously, comment period ends November 24th. Um, they'll obviously listen, hear the comments and then uh, come forward with either 
the same bill or an amended bill, but we don't know yet uh, what the actual date is. Are you good, Councillor uh, Strange? Yes. Yep. Uh, okay. Councillor Newstead? What if we, uh, uh, we're again saying the same thing, so I think we just need to have that clarification. So we agree with concerns. And instead of defer, what if we said, and we would like immediate discussion with the minister, or not maybe not immediate, but um, pend like something that puts an urgency to it. Um, again, getting this affordable housing or housing affordability issue um, moving forward. So instead of saying deferred, again, that sounds delayed. If we said, but we want immediate consultation or uh, something to the point that we want the minister, we have questions, we'd like answers from the minister, we want to have a conversation, we want that minister to hear our concerns. Um, or if we want to prioritize discussions, or what's another word? Yeah. Help, help, help us with a word. Like, I know it's what you're like saying. Semantics, you want to, right? Because when you tell them what to do, I know sometimes people do the other. It <coughs> doesn't always get you what you want. Is there a word that says immediate? Lori, would you, um, through, through the mayor, sorry. unfortunately, the premier's history in doing what he wants is he does what he wants. He, he, he said he wasn't going to touch the green belt and here we are, he's touching the green belt. I don't think that a word that n normal everyday people would understand and appreciate, I don't think that is going to do anything. If, I, I think it needs to be a strong message to say we don't want the bill as it is, we need to talk. So the... the there, there is through, through you, the mayor, can I, I don't know how this is, works. But exactly what she, you just said, we need to talk. And I, I, we have concerns, but we need to talk and keep the process going. So maybe we can amend it with, I love your words, that we need to talk. So can I just, uh, the CAO has an idea too, just Great, to throw into the mix, just to make things more confusing. So let's just. <laughs> and through the chair and, and, and uh, or through the mayor, sorry. Um, and uh, you know, I I don't do this lately. It's not appropriate for staff to comment on on councillors' motions, but uh, maybe a consideration. If I am reading the conversation here, there's concerns that delay postpones action, uh, but you want some consultation. So if you put the wording in for uh, some consultation and for the minister or the appropriate ministers to respond formally back to the municipality on their rationale, I think that's what creates the dialogue so that you've raised concerns and that you'd want a formal response back on those concerns is the opportunity for dialogue. Doesn't mean it defers anything, uh, but it, uh, you know, it forces them to address the concerns that we have. So I think if you maybe want a wordsmith uh, formal response versus a delay that, you know, in theory, they could just go take their comments, wait 90 days, they've delayed and, and pass what they want where a, a response is is a bit more proactive and then there's some rationale there for, for that response they could choose to ignore us also but I think a response and the tone of this is to create that dialogue to solve the problem thank you mr. CEO the provincial government didn't give us an opportunity to um, comment on the earlier 109 our, our staff did send comments they didn't give us an opportunity they didn't give an opportunity for the Association of Municipalities of Ontario to comment. They had to do their own commenting and bring that up. A lot of professional organizations weren't given the opportunity. I honestly don't think that this government is going to listen to our soft words. I think this is going to be one of the most important decisions that we make. Housing is extremely important. We've all heard it. And usually I'm also all about negotiating and that sort of thing but I'm stuck on this word defer I think this this is so important if we don't say that it's important to stop it and let's have the discussion I don't think anything's going to happen so that's me personally I don't want to tie up anybody's um, and any more time on this um, a lot of times I can negotiate and um, um, what's the word I'm looking for um, reason and, and change things just because it's not important. I feel that this is so important we need to stay with the strong wording. I think uh, Councillor Neustag was just uh, trying to, she wants to support it, but she's saying, you know, this is to, to support it, I, I, I need you to come my way. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. I don't know if people get the Toronto Star, but this morning's Toronto Star 
Uh, Greenbelt flip-flop leaves me at a loss, and it's by Edward Keenan. Premier Doug Ford recently announced he was flip-flopping on a sole, solemn pledge to protect the Greenbelt. Under the banner of his pledge to build new housing, he's opening for development 15 specific areas of land around the GTA that were previously protected. An investigation conducted by the Toronto Star surpri revealed, surprise, surprise, that much of that land is owned by developers who are big donors to or otherwise have ties to Ford's party some of whom only recently bought the properties that are conveniently about to <coughs> skyrocket in value. This whole thing is really coming to a head. And, and there are so many things in the press these days about his flip-flop. Uh, I, I agree, we, we, we can't make this kind. We need to be firm in what we're saying. There are senior citizens living at in their houses right now that will no longer be able to afford that house, living in that house if this bill goes through and we have to jump the taxes by 25%. It's gonna create more problems for those individuals who are living on the line right now. This bill <clears throat> needs to be gotten rid of, it, or it needs to be revised, it needs to be debated. And if we come through just nice and quietly, they're gonna say, we need to be firm in what we're, we're, we're wanting to do. If this is not what council wants to do, then that's okay. But I'm telling you right now that There's going to be a lot of conflict <coughs> with respect to Doug Ford and this Bill 23. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, do we have any other comment or discussion points or questions? Call the vote, please. Okay, so are there any other questions or comments before we call the vote? Well, we, are part way through the vote. we are part way through. We were, okay, we are actually part way through the vote, folks, so. So we're, I'm going to re read it again because it's been about 50, yeah, I'm going to read it right now. Uh, okay, so the first one that you're voting on right now, I think three people, you've already done three, council, uh, Mr. Clerk? Yeah. Therefore, the Niagara Falls City Council is concerned about Bill 23 as it stands and requests the province defer passage of Bill 23 until such time as further evaluation, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the motion that we're voting on right now. The amendment. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So after that debate, uh, I don't see that the motion or that amendment to the motion has changed since I started calling the vote. Vote. Uh, we had Councillor Baldinelli in favor. We had Councillor Campbell in favor. We had Councillor Lococo in favor. I'll now go to Councillor Newestag. I'm hearing opposed. Councillor Patel. Opposed. I would like to change the word deferred. Uh, Councillor Strange. Against. Councillor Thompson. No. And Councillor Diodati. I'm opposed as well. So that, that uh, amendment to the motion is defeated. Okay, so the next one, Mr. Clerk, um, I'm gonna read. Therefore, council strongly recommends that substantial provincial investments be provided to support communities to fund anticipated infrastructure upgrades to accommodate new intensification goals and compensate for decrease of development charge funding opportunities as outlined in the proposed legislation. Is that good? Okay, and uh, we've got a seconder, Councilor, uh, yep, yes, Campbell, second. okay. Is there any questions about that? It's pretty straightforward. Recorded vote. Yeah, they'll all be recorded. So amendment number two, Councillor Baldinelli. In favor. Councillor Campbell. In favor. 
Councillor Lococo? In favor. Councillor Neustag? In favor. Councillor Patel? In favor. Councillor Strange? In favor. Councillor Thompson? No. And Mayor Diodati? I'm fine with that. Okay, that amendment passes. Okay. Next one. Therefore, the council authorized staff to provide comment to the Environmental Registry of Ontario regarding proposed Bill 23 prior to November 24th. So could I just get clarification on that one, Councillor, through staff? Um, is that what you'd be doing anyway with your report, um, Ms. Dolch? Through you, er, <laughs> your worship, no. Our report's just going to the minister directly. Um, but she's just clarifying that it go to the ERO. What does that mean? I don't even know what that means. So right now the province has, has, has on the uh, environmental registry a copy of the bill and they're asking for comments. Uh, you can submit it through the ERO or you can submit it to the minister. Okay. Both are the same comment same. function. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, and you're, you're good with that, Councillor? And uh, Councillor Cameron? Sure. Yep. Okay. Mr. Clerk? Okay, we'll call the vote then on amendment paragraph number three. Uh, Councillor Baldinelli. In favor. Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Lococo. In favor. Councillor Neustag. In favor. Councillor Patel. In favor. Councillor Strange. In favor. Councillor Thompson. No. And Mayor Diodati. Four. And that passes. Okay, and then Therefore, that council receive this report for information and that staff forward the report to the Premier, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Region of Niagara, local area municipalities, and local MPPs. Mr. Yeah. Mayor, um, the first part of that is receive the report that's in the original recommendation of, from staff, so you can take that one out. Uh, okay. The council received for information and that staff forward the report to the premier, that's new. The Minister of Municipal Affairs was already approved, so we can take the minister, municipal, mun, municipal Affairs and Housing out. Yep. The Region of Niagara was already in there, we can take that out. And it's local area municipalities, we can take that out. And at, so it's just local members of provincial parliament. Okay. So Right. Yes. So that we forward this to the premier and local MPPs. Correct. Thank Is that you. Right. Okay. Mr. Clerk, is everyone good with that? Can you read that, please? So, uh, therefore, that this report be forwarded to the premier and to the local MPPs. So that this report will be the report that our staff did, along with these uh, rec uh, amendments. Yeah. Yes. Is everybody good with that? Everybody good? Yes. Our seconder is good. Yes. yes. The staff. Pardon me? Yes. Yes. Mr. Clerk? Okay, Councillor Baldinelli. In favor. Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Lococo. In favor. Uh, Councillor Neustag. In favor. Councillor Patel. In favor. Councillor Strange. In favor. Councillor Thompson. Yes. And Mayor Dudaddy. I'm for. And that's unanimous. There you go. And now, Councillor uh, Neustag, did you want to add, you suggested uh, engaging the yes. ministry or the minister or something yes. like that. Did you want to add a, another? Yes. Yes, if I can add the amendment that um, to have discussions, I know it's kind, but just to start discussions um, with the Minister of um, Municipal Affairs and Housing um, to, to express our concerns, but to, to keep this dialogue going so that we can move forward and getting um, housing affordability in place. Okay. Second. Okay. Motion by Councillor Newestake, second by Councillor Thompson. Is there discussion to the motion? No? Yeah, Councillor Strange. Have a, like, is there a timeline just so we can get, <laughs> we can get it before this, this bill passes, or as soon as we can? Yeah, as soon Immediate as possible. Yeah. Yes. Immediate discussion. We would put it in as part of the we would contact them on the same timeline to set up the discussion. Okay. So staff will take it as quickly as possible. Okay. Is everybody clear with this? Okay. And uh, did you want to record a vote on this too? Sure. Okay. Might as well stay consistent. <laughs> Use more, more it's like paper. You guys are like the region now. <laughs> 
a no. recorded vote. Oh, on a recorded vote. A motion will go on for a long time there. Okay, that uh, last uh, amendment, Councillor Baldinelli. Favor. Uh, Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Lococo. In favor. Councillor Duesteg. In favor. Councillor Patel. In favor. Councillor Strange. In favor. Councillor Thompson. In favor. And Mayor Diodati. I'm in favor. And that's unanimous. That's good. Are we done on this one? <laughs> yes. God. Do we have the motion that was actually in the report covered? He read it. I made sure he read it. He read it off at the beginning, so that is yeah. part of. Yes, that's right. Part of right. That was you. the first thing we did. Let's just make sure before we leave this. Just you need to just think. You know, what they say measure twice, cut once. Do we need to double check? <coughs> is everybody good? So now you've accepted all the amendments. Now you can pass the vote. Yeah. Do you want just as a double, just to make sure? Yeah. Okay. So then now. Can I get a motion to receive all of the amendments into one? Okay, motion by Councillor Lococo, second by Councillor Campbell, keep it consistent. We'll call that vote. All those in favor? Do you want a recorded vote? <laughs> the clerk just growled. I'm out of sheets. I, I'm, I'm out of sheets. Okay. You can never work at the region. No. All in favor? Okay, opposed? Okay, so it's one opposed. All right, that's, that's passed. Thank you. Okay. And he's out of sheets. Part of it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now we are going to 12 on your agendas. Shoot all the way back down again, please. Can I go wake up Vic? Oh, yeah, yeah, please go get it. grab Vic. He's probably gone. We'll just wait one minute, everybody. We're almost done. We're so close. We're 12, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. So, Councillor Peter Ranger, we are on 12. Communications and comments of the city clerk. Mm -hmm. And we only have one item 12.1 and it's concerns regarding noise bylaw and air conditioners so there's a recommendation that we that we refer to staff all right look at that it hits the ground running motion by council for second by council strange that we re that we refer this to staff all those in favor okay what was that it's gonna be morning soon it's gonna be morning soon. it will be okay thank you for that that's approved unanimously now we're going to 13 Communications and comments of the city clerk. 13.1, uh, we have a letter from Minister Clark. Um, so the recommendation is council give direction to staff to report back on the municipal, municipal housing targets and pledges. So we're looking, Councillor, uh, motion by Councillor Strange, uh, second by Councillor Patel. Uh, if there's no discussion, we'll call the vote. All those, you have discussion, Councillor Coco? Well, I have a question. That council give direction to staff to report back on the housing targets and the pledges. They already gave us the housing target and the pledges. So, what what is staff reporting back for? Uh, the progress. Oh, the progress. Okay, thank you. Okay, so all those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Oh, you can come back, Councilor Peter Angelo. We're so good. I've never seen anyone walk so slow. That was unbelievable. It was like Carol Burnett, you know. Okay. Okay. Item thirteen point two. I am. Appointments to Niagara Transit Commission Board. So there's a recommendation that council consider one member of city council, one member of regional council be forwarded to the clerk as the two Niagara Falls nominees for transit commission. So yes, Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll put my name forward. Um, I, I do believe that I do have some experience. Done. <laughs> All right. Any, no need to talk any further. I'll second that. Okay, second by Councillor Strange. Yes, uh, Councillor Campbell. I want to put my name forward on that. Oh, you do too? Okay. Yeah. All right, so we might have to have a vote on that then. Um, so it's one should city. We ask if anyone else does? Yep, that's awesome. Yeah, that's, oh, sorry, Mr. Clark, I'm going to pass over to you. I should have done that anyway. So. Yeah, I know I spoke at the uh, orientation that I would uh, first want to get today's meeting underway and out, out of the way before we started uh, making appointments to various boards and committees and commissions. Uh, however, I was getting uh, a comment from the regional clerk 
that they were looking for this uh, ASAP. I think uh, since they're looking for two nominees from Niagara Falls and it's also open to regional councillors, I thought it was appropriate that there be one from this council and one from regional council. I have canvassed the, the regional uh, councillors. It's not something that this, that this council really needs to vote on. And so far, I've only heard back from Councillor Morocco. So I would like to wait till I heard back to see if there's interest from the other two regional councils before I submit that off to the uh, regional clerk. But I think it is a good idea that uh, if, if there are any others that uh, do have interest, um, you can see the comments from the regional clerk there as to uh, what would be involved. I've also uh, found out that they'd be meeting approximately once a month on Tuesday afternoons at 3 p.m if that factors into your decision. So why don't we, yes, Can Councilman. I ask a question about that? Our, our meetings are on Tuesday, so whoever takes it, what if it's the same day as a 3 p.m. transit and a 4 p.m. council meeting? Huh. I, I was uh, thinking you were going to say like one o'clock or something and then maybe we could do it, but at three o'clock that's going to cut it a little tight. Now that council has approved the schedule for next year, I will forward that on to the region and hopefully they can work around that. Uh, when there is a, a conflict, um, you might have to start at one place and finish up at the other. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there are some other conflicts that may exist as well. Do you recommend, do we, should we defer until you find, like if there, let's say there's no interest at the region, then I'm we okay might fill them both with our city council and also if we can confirm the timing, that might help us decide because you can't be at two places at once. So I'm just wondering, is, it, is there anything time sensitive for this one? Again, the, the regional clerk just suggested as soon as possible. If as soon as possible is at the December 13th meeting, then I, I, I'm okay recommending deferral. We meet in three weeks. I mean, what's your thoughts? That gives us time to canvass the regional members and then yeah. we'll know better timing, yeah? Okay, so should we just defer that to the December meeting? Motion, motion for deferral? Okay, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? So we'll defer that to the next meeting, okay? Um, 13.3, Niagara Parks Commission. Uh, okay, the recommendation moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange. Do we have any discussion to that, Councillor Coco? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have a question. Um, last term, you and Councillor Cario were on, and I, I did speak to the clerk, and he said that Councillor Cario was a resident. No. He was a city council appointee. So with this one now, we're just appointing you. Is there a reason why we're dropping one councillor, I guess, is my question. Well, I can explain it. So yeah, the tradition and the way it is in the other um, <coughs> um, communities that are in the Niagara Parks catchment area, which is Niagara and Lake, Fort Erie, Niagara Falls, <coughs> there was always the mayor that was appointed as the Niagara Parks Commission rep. And it was that way, and it got changed approximately, I don't know, 15 years ago. Uh, that's about 2006. it. 2006. 2006, yeah. okay. And uh, yeah, I'll come to you, Councillor. And um, at that time, the council changed and put a member of council on it. So we put Councillor Cario. And when I was elected mayor in 2010, Councillor Cario offered for me to take that position again. And I said, well, let me just see if I can come in through the region. And then I'll, let me see how that plays out. Well, I, I was able to get in through the region, <coughs> and then Councillor Cario kept it. And we've been maintaining that for the last 12 years. And my suggestion to the clerk was, the proper way is to fix what we had undone so that the mayor should always be there. And I'm sure Councillor Thompson's going to, because he was there for a long time, longer than me, and he was always the, the rep for the city there. And it's very important, I can tell you, I haven't been there for the last number of years, it's very important that we have that uh, representation there with the other mayors. Um, so that's why the suggestion was like that. And um, so that's that was the explanation. Now I'll go to Councillor Thompson, he's anxious to say something. Um. I, I was there for 17 years with the parks and I thought it was always the mayor and but you got in there. Yeah. So I think w with the changes are taking place, um, you made a motion. I'll second that the uh, mayor be, be the... Um, uh, yeah, we already got a motion. The, yeah, we already got the motion and second on this side, Wayne. We, we can always appoint oh. you twice. <laughs> you can appoint me twice. That's oh. fine too. Okay. Yeah. So they've already. Yeah. Thank you okay. for that, though. Is there any other questions uh, to this? Okay. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? 
Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Um, 14, ratification of in camera, Mr. Clerk. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Uh, council did meet in camera on November 18th for education session. Uh, there is nothing to ratify there as council was uh, uh, just going through their orientation. Uh, that concluded um, uh, November 21st uh, for further in-camera session, again, for orientation and education purposes, as was previously passed uh, by way of resolution. Uh, council met again this afternoon in camera uh, after resolution was passed and the ratification of the in camera could read that the that direction be given to staff regarding settlement instructions uh, with respect to a planning matter and also that direction be given to staff with regards to negotiations around sole sourcing of a service and to report back to city council for approval at a later date. Okay, so we're looking for a, a motion to receive the in-camera, um, the ratification for the in-camera meeting. So moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor um, Baldinelli. Sorry, you had comment? I'm sorry, Councillor Coco. Wasn't there another one we were going to ratify? The in-camera procedures. Oh, good catch. Yeah, well, we could do that here. As I mentioned in in-camera, uh, I thought it would come back publicly when the uh, amendment to the procedural bylaws done, but uh, uh, there was further direction given to staff for um, uh, the process for in-camera reports uh, that they continue now to go back uh, through the councillor's uh, agenda notes app, uh, that the reports be made uh, available to them ahead of the meeting, and also that uh, notes can be taken in those meetings. And of course, we'll have to waive the uh, the no electronics being allowed in the meeting mm -hmm. since now the reports will be on the councillor's iPads. Uh, we'll bring that back to uh, council uh, by way of procedural amendments. Okay, so we've got motion by, who made the motion again? Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Baldinelli, right? Okay, any other questions? Uh, good catch, Councillor Coco. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous, thank you for that. So now we go on to bylaws and, and just before I call the motion, uh, there's two traditions. So one is you should understand we've changed this past term the way we do this. And we have a little funny tradition. The same person always makes this motion. Don't ask me how we got there. But Mr. Clerk, can you just explain for our new members what we're doing when we're giving the, the bylaws the first, second, and third reading? No one ever explained it when I was here. I just had to figure it out. But I just, so you guys you understand. Yeah, just going back procedurally, uh, traditionally bylaws do require third readings. Uh, we used to go over and over and over it again, and I'm finding that uh, common practice in a lot of municipalities now is just to give the bylaws uh, all three readings and just done in one motion. You'll notice that the last bylaw on every council meeting is what's called a confirmatory bylaw, and what that does is it just confirms or adopts or ratifies any of the business that is taking place uh, at tonight's uh, council meeting. So we'll look for a motion to adopt the bylaws. Councillor Peter Angelo. <laughs> it's a motion to do a first, second, and third reading, and we've got a seconder by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you for that. So now we go to new business. So this is your chance. If you, unless I'm sorry, and I just before I get over, there's notice of motion. Is there any notices of motion? <coughs> okay, new business, Councillor Campbell. Just, uh, I just got an email that there is a microphone. Rally, microphone. I just got an email that there is a rally at the regional building on Thursday, from November the 24th from nine to 10, with respect to uh, protesting against Bill 23. A.M.? A.M. Okay. Thank you for that. Any other new, Councilor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. I was just gonna mention, I, I don't know if uh, Council is gonna have a chance to talk about, um, like not only who sits on committees, but uh, what committees we have, or if that's something that staff is going to bring back. Uh, just one of the changes that um, that I think we're going to end up bringing to council. I mean, Park in the City used to be environmental planning and greening, and then uh, the city wanted to get engaged in communities in bloom. 
so they renamed EPNG to Park in the City. Um, we stopped doing communities in bloom. Uh, we're more uh, of an environmental focus. Uh, the volunteers that we have are very good. They want to do a lot of tree plantings. They want to do a lot of community events that, um, that have environmental awareness. Uh, so they've asked that we change the name of Park in the City back to the Environmental Advisory Committee. Still an advisory committee of council, and they still want to do all the events, but they really want to focus on, <coughs> on planting trees and just environmental awareness. So we're no longer going to be the park in the city, but I know that there's a couple other members on council that are really keen on beautification. So I, I don't know if it's possible. I mean, I can pass it back to staff. Perhaps we could have a beautification committee. Um, I see some other uh, sort of short-term committees that we could possibly have. I know we're looking at instituting a new cemetery. Um, maybe we could have a committee for that. Um, I know I brought up the idea of having a hospice. I'd love to have a committee for that, um, just so that we can be a little bit more involved, Your Worship, uh, before the actual decisions get to council. I, I don't know whether or not we're going to end up having a discussion on committees we would like to see, or if we're just going to go with the traditional committees that staff bring forward. That was more my comment. Well, good discussion points. I'm sure staff would love a bunch more committees to attend, right? <laughs> staff, <laughs> I could just see them all like getting all. So, um, so no, but that it's good discussion. So let's talk about it, Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had a thought, and I wasn't going to bring it up until Councillor Peter Angelo did. Um, our residents are feeling unsafe. Um, there's a lot of things going on all across Canada, in our province, in, in our region, in our city. Uh, shootings, stabbings, um, dr drug overdoses. A lot of people are not feeling safe, and I'd like to put forward a, a, a safety committee. Okay. Oh, she's <laughs> had another one. Okay. okay. No, I, I had that on my list. I didn't know when to bring it up. It was something that I heard over and over again from our residents. We're here to serve our residents, and they do not feel safe in our own city. So um, I think it's important, and I looked at different, um, different committees in, in different cities about how they make it up. They have a police, police officer there, um, business owners, um, different organizations, uh, just a member of the public. You can also do it where you divide the city in diff different areas and have one person from different areas. There's a whole bunch of different ways, but since Councillor Peter Angelo was talking about other committees, I'm bringing this one up. And I would think BIAs may want to have a voice on those, right? Yes, that was the other thing in it, sorry. Yeah, so what's the best way, Mr. Clerk, so that we're not just all throwing out names of committees? Because I'm going to name one, too. I want to, like, support the mayor committee. I want to start that one. No, I'm kidding. So what, what do you recommend? Uh, we you next? find volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to be paid volunteers. Well, we can take this away as direction to staff, and uh, I think the first thing that would need to be done is as having terms of reference established before uh, we just all of a sudden name a new committee. We'd have to have something that uh, gives some, some bones and some, some background to uh, what that committee would be involved with before we start advertising for people to sit on that committee. So um, we could take that back to with staff and look at some possible uh, terms of reference. Yeah. Councillor Peter. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I, I guess the other thing I wanted to mention, too, was our strategic priorities. I guess we're going to come together at a later date to kind of formulate our strategic priorities. I know traditionally in the past, staff have, you know, looked at some of the literature that we've put out uh, in our elections to try to gather the strategic priorities. Um, last term of council, I floated the idea of having some type of team building session. Uh, I, I, th I think it would be a great time to kind of combine the two and let council have a lot of input into what our strategic priorities would be. Um, maybe that's something that staff can take back as well, discuss and then schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think and it's a great start. Start with our literature, because that's what we campaigned on it and were elected with, right? So yeah. the things that are key priorities, like, like housing and you know all the different things, homelessness and whatnot. So, um, so is this so direction of staff where they'll come back with uh, yeah, it's already kind of scheduled, so I think that means it's kind of Mr. Scheduled. Mayor, I'll forward the information about the safety committees because yeah. we've already compiled a bunch of it. Yeah, that's great. And, and you know what? If anybody has any suggestions on committees and you've got some, some bones, as uh, the, the clerk suggests, maybe send them through and then they could kind of figure out. And I know uh, uh, Ms. Moldenhauer was discussing the idea of changing uh, the committee because, as you say, it was EPNG. It was EPNG. went to Park in the City. And the idea was to bring the parks, the Niagara Parks, into the city to make it, and now that you've beautified all the major intersections, 
and now they're just replanting. You change your focus now, right, on more environmental. So then that's great. So it just adapts and moves along kind of thing. So, and then we gotta make sure we got enough counselors to go on all these committees too. That's the other thing. I mean, uh, that was, pardon me? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I chair them all. I'm looking for some more things to do, so that'd be great. I'm kidding. I'm not looking for more things to do. Are you finished? I think so. Okay, Councilor Change? Yes, Councilor, I, I or, sorry, Mr. Mayor, I was actually thinking that we might have some of the sparkle awards today showing up on the, on the big screen from Halloween, but I know it's been a very, very busy. Spooky awards. Spooky awards. Sparkle awards coming up. Yeah. Yeah, the spooky awards, sorry. Um, and I just, maybe we can, I can give direction to, to staff to maybe come back with yeah. some of the winners uh, at the next council meeting, because they're really pretty good. I don't oh, know if everyone saw them on yeah. Well, I had to deliver some of the awards. Yeah, there was the one where there was the, looked like a real human being, like, uh, I can't remember that show, the girl, and they're playing that music. Stranger Things. Stranger Things. Oh, she, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Knows, eh? On Ryle. Yeah, 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 so yeah. it was pretty I good. Said, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's something that was championed by, by Councillor Dabrowski, and he did a really good job. And, uh, and I, I guess we'll have the Sparkle Awards, and we're going to continue that, I, I believe. Yeah, well, if council directs it, it'll continue. Yeah. I, so hopefully we can, and, and then maybe we can send something out um, next meeting uh, just to, to those people who want to participate. And I know they get, I don't know if it's top five prizes or something like that. Or well, should we just clear up right now? Like, because yeah, Christmas we'll, is around the corner. We're, we're doing, no, but we're doing Spark Awards. Yes, <laughs> What do you mean as far as you know? If, if you don't know, who knows? Can maybe we just get some information next council meeting on it? Okay. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, sorry, there was an article in yesterday's paper that the downtown BIA is taking over the yeah. Sparkle Awards. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think we're providing support for them to run oh, the Sparkle Awards. I see. Okay, okay, so there you go. Perfect. So it's continuing. <laughs> yes. So we're running out of time. People already got the lights and, and, going. And even, you know, the, the Christmas parade was was uh, oh. the Santa Claus parade was amazing oh. and I think every council was there just there I, I haven't seen that many people no. downtown no ever yeah. like last year it was good but this year was just amazing and uh, little, little faith the heaters heroes that lit up the tree even though there was a little bit of delay because of your technical problems or whatever yeah. it was it, it turned out really really well and uh, you know maybe we can um, uh, get some, some pictures and video for next council meeting as well. So we'll mention that to uh, Ms. Ruzulo, Ruzulo, <laughs> she can help us out with that and we'll put some on the screen. Yeah, Perfect. I think that's a great okay. idea. Okay. okay. Any other new business? Seeing none, we're looking for a motion for adjournment. Councillor Campbell, yeah. Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Thank you and we're adjourned. Thank you everybody. Good, uh, good work, eh? Baptism by fire for all the new <laughs> yeah, people. Yeah. yeah.